الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام الرسول اللہ وعلیٰ علی وصاب اجمین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ادو اللہ سب علی رب کب الحکمہ ولمحدت الحسنہ وجاد البلت حسن رب شہلی صدری ویسلی عمری وحل العدت من لسانی افکو کولی My respected elders and my brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. There have been requests since several years that since normally I give a talk for approximately one hour to one and a half hour, and the question answer session goes for more than two to two and a half hours. There was a request always by people for many years that why don't you have an exclusive only question answer session so that the audience, at least they are satisfied in quenching their thirst. So on the request and public demand, this year we thought, let's have one evening, at least more than three hours, only for question answer session. So on the request of the various audiences, that we have had. This is the first time we'll be having an exclusive question on session. And as the coordinator has mentioned, that first we'd like to give chance first to the non-Muslims. So I request my non-Muslim brothers and sisters that if you have any questions regarding Islam and compatible religion, if you have any query, if you have any misunderstanding, even if you do not agree with a single teaching of Islam, this is the opportunity to question and inshallah I am young I can take your questions and I'll try my level best with the limited knowledge that I have that I'll try and reply to your questions so I request the Muslim brothers and sisters to first give the chance to our non-Muslim brothers and sisters and after they have quenched their thirst we would allow the Muslim brothers and sisters Jazakallah shukran today's evening session has exclusively been reserved only for the open question and answers with Dr. Zakir Naik called Ask Dr. Zakir. Feel free, feel confident, feel at your right to ask questions to Dr. Zakir that you dare not ask others for fear of being ridiculed or blamed for criticizing Islam. I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, I'm your host and coordinator, inshallah, fair and caring too, for this session, in which is enshrined your right to ask Dr. Zakir and his duty to answer to the best of his knowledge and understanding. Brothers and sisters, to answer your questions in this exclusive session, please welcome Dr. Zakir Naik. Before, before we start, may I kindly request our large audience collected here to kindly maintain the due decorum this program deserves. The rules for the question and answer session is, you may ask any question on Islam and comparative religion. Your question should be brief and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked by you for your second question. You would have to go back and line up again in the queue and await your chance. We have microphones placed in various sections in our audience. There are five microphones, in the, uh, three for the gents and two for the ladies section. Microphone.
the one microphone is there just in front of the gen section and the other two in the rare sections. You may line up at any of the microphones, that's for the gents. And we have two microphones here for the ladies, one in the front and one in the rare sections. Non-Muslims will be given preference to ask questions first and if time permits, Muslim brothers and sisters would, inshallah, be offered their chance. Volunteers at the mics are requested to kindly and firmly ensure the same. The questioners are kindly requested to please state your name clearly as well as your profession before putting forward your question so that Dr. Zakir can give you a more appropriate answer. May I request Dr. Zakir to please present his initial comments for one or two minutes before we start the session. Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Al Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahibi ajmain. Amma baad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman r-Rahim. A'udhu ila sabili rabbika bil-hikmah. Wal mu'azid al-hasna. Wajadun billati hasan. Rabbi shahli sadri. Wa salli amri. Wa ahlul uqdatu min lisani yafkaw kawli. My respected elders and my brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. There have been requests since several years that since normally I give a talk for approximately one hour to one and a half hour and the question answer session goes for more than two to two and a half hours. There was a request always by people for many years that why don't you have an exclusive only question answer session so that the audience at least they are satisfied in quenching the thirst. So on the request and public demand, this year we thought, let's have one evening, at least more than three hours, only for question and session. So on the request of the various audiences that we have had, this is the first time we'll be having an exclusive question and session. And as the coordinator has mentioned, that first we'd like to give chance first to the non-Muslims, so I request my non-Muslim brothers and sisters that if you have any questions regarding Islam and comparative religion, if you have any query, if you have any misunderstanding, even if you do not agree with a single teaching of Islam, this is the opportunity to question. And inshallah, I'm young, I can take your questions and I'll try my level best with the limited knowledge that I have that I'll try and reply to your questions. So I request the Muslim brothers and sisters to first give the chance to our non-Muslim brothers and sisters and after they have quenched their thirst, we would allow the Muslim brothers and sisters. Jazakallah shukran. With the first question on the mic on my left. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah Dr. Naik, uh, first let me just say I'm really honored to be standing in front of you. I've watched your programs on Peace TV a lot and I really think you're great. Can we have so, your name? Yeah, my name is Mahesh Ursekar and I am a PhD student in the Department of Philosophy of Mumbai University. Uh, my question is a little technical. Uh, I would like to know what the concept of soul is in Islam. As you know, in a lot of Indian philosophy, soul and mind are uh, uh, taken as different, whereas in Western philosophy, soul and mind is considered as the same. So uh, my first question is, what is the concept of soul? in uh, uh, Islam and the second question is what is the relationship of the soul to the body so that after death uh, you know does the soul leave the body and uh, you know uh, uh, things like that so there is a two-part question what is the concept of the soul and how is it related to the body and what happens to it after death thank you but the Mahesh has asked the question that what is the concept of soul in Islam and what is the relationship of the soul and the human body and what will happen to the soul after death? That's the basic question. That's correct. Uh, as far as the soul is concerned, the soul is the essence of the human body. The main importance as compared to the other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
creation of Almighty God. The major difference in the human being, it is the soul. And it is the essence which will remain even after a person dies, which I'll discuss later on. As far as science is concerned, science does not speak about soul. Science hasn't reached that level where it can decipher what is the exact essence of the soul. But there have been researches done that when any living creature dies, for example, animal when he dies, as compared to a human being, when an animal dies, immediately after when he dies, there's no difference in the weight. But when we analyze the weight of a human being, the moment he dies and he seizes life, immediately there's loss of weight. That means there is something that the human being is losing the moment he dies. But science hasn't reached that level so far to decipher what exactly is soul. Soul is the essence of the human being. And the Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185, Allah says, Kullu nafsin zaykatul maut. Every soul shall have a taste of death. In this world, this life is the test for the hereafter. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allazi khalakal mawta wal hayata. That Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So this life is a test for the hereafter. And every soul shall have a taste of death. When once a person dies, his soul is not there. But on the day of judgment, when he'll be resurrected, then depending upon the good deeds and the bad deeds he has done, Almighty God, on the day of judgment, he is Malik Ramadin, he is the master of the day of judgment, depending upon how you have failed the test in this world, depending on that, then your result will be whether you go to paradise or hell. So the soul is that lives. Soul doesn't die. It only has a taste of death when a person body dies. So the relationship with the body and soul put together, you have the human being here. But in the year after, there will be absolutely a new body given and the soul will survive. And then depending upon how you have fed the test, you will go to heaven or hell. Hope that answers the question. Is the soul the same as the mind? But that was the question that, is, it the, is the soul the same as the mind? No. Mind, again, mind is abstract. If I ask you, where is your mind? So we will say, okay, fine, you know, mind, is it in the brain? So this is an abstract word, like how you say, mind your own business. You know, so mind, when we say people start thinking of the brain, but that doesn't mean that the mind is in the brain, but it is different. So mind is again an abstract word, that if you scientifically medical college, I do not know where the mind is placed. But when we talk about the mind, normally start thinking about the brain, but that's an abstract word. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, brother. Hello, my name is Mahesh Mehta. I am a re retired person. I visited 15 Islamic countries, Salah area for main Women are different everywhere. Even Masjid and Nabvi, Salah area for men and women is different. Karbala, Najab, Kajmen, Samra, Damascus, Masak, men and women, Salah area are different. But during the Hajj time, Mina, Muzdilfa, Arafat, Safa, Marwa, and when doing Tawaf of Kaaba Sari, men and women are together. And Dome of the Rock and al aqsa Masjid, uh, 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 Betul Mukadas in Jerusalem, men and women are together. Why? But the Mahesh Mehta has asked a good question. And we know Mahesh Mehta since several years, since the conception of IRF, mashallah, he is the person who is a non Muslim who used to take video cassettes when we started in 1991 and maximum cassettes he has taken. And I feel that he has seen more cassettes of IRF than any other Muslim also. He has asked the question that when he has been to many mosques throughout the world, most of the places, the prayer area for men and women, it is separate. But when he went to Hajj, and when he went to Makkah and Mina, Muzdalifa, the prayer area is the same and men and women are mixed and separate. What does the face to realize? that everywhere, even in Makkah, 
and in Muzdalifa and Mina, the prayer area is same. But because of the situation, for example, when we go to Makkah, and there, one of the important pillars is you do tawaf. Now, when you do tawaf, you can't have separate area for tawaf. That's the reason while doing tawaf, there's bound to be, we can't have separate spaces. But after they finish tawaf, normally men and women have got different designated areas, even in Makkah. But while they're doing tawaf, if the salah time takes place, some women may not reach the designated place, so there are occasions when they stand in areas which is not designated for the women. So because of this, there are occasions when we find, when we see, there may be some women mixed up in the gent area, but ideally, you see, when you come at the rear side, not of the tawaf, not of the mutaf, at the other part, you find that there is separate designated area for the women and separate for the men. In normal mosque that we have, the entry gates of men and women is separate. In haram, there are separate areas even for women to enter. But because when they go for tawaf, there is bound to be that they mix. But when they pray, they are supposed to be at different areas. But because the time may not permit them to reach the area, there are occasions when you may find that there may be certain mixing on certain positions. Same thing in Mina. Same thing in Muzdalifah. Even in Muzdalifah and Mina, you will never find men and women standing in the same room. Because they are scattered, it's a very big area. We, because they come with their families, same when they come for the Haram, in Makkah they come with the family. So here, because they come with family, to have separate segregation, half, suppose it may be 100 acres, so half for gents, half for ladies, then the family cannot stay together. In all the other mosques, because the mosque is small, you can easily have separate area for Salah, separate for entry, separate for exit, and they can meet the family outside. Here, because Muzdalifah, Arafat is hundreds of acres, and the family come together to do Hajj, while they stay in Arafat, Mina, Muzdalifah, so at that time, even when they pray, men and women don't stand in the same row. There is a separate area, but the areas are scattered. Because of that, it may not look that they are separate. But if you go to Masjid al-Khaif, that is in Mina, or in Arafat, Masjid al-Namra, there, there is separate segregation, just like any other mosque. Because when they pray in a large gathering, in a large area, it is difficult when families come together. Otherwise, always men and women, they are supposed to be separate. Why? Separate, but equal facility. The reason is so that they can concentrate on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better and there's no intermingling of sexes. Hope that answers the question, brother. Yes, brother. Third mic, is it on? If there's no one, there's no one on the mic, we allow the fourth mic, the ladies, we can have the question from the ladies section. Yeah. First mic. Assalamu alaikum, bhai aur bairna uko. Mera, mein Sangi Sigra Shah, teacher hoon. Mera question hai ki ek non-Muslim mard Allah ki ibadadat kar sakta hai, magar ek shadi shuda non-Muslim aurat Allah ki ibadat karne mein usse takli pa sakti hai. To usko kaise hal kiya jai aur Muslim samaj ne iske liye kya kiya hai? Shukriya. This was the question that for an adult Muslim man, it's easy to do ibadah, easy to pray. But for a Muslim adult woman who's married, it's difficult to ibadah, there can be difficulties. So what, what is the reason? As far as salah is concerned, the duty of salah is and the ibadah is the same for the man and woman. And I discussed this one week back when I gave the talk on women's rights in Islam, protected or subjugated. And Quran clearly states in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 35, Inna al muslimina wal muslimati for Muslim men and women. Wal mu'minina wal mu'minati for believing men and women. Wal qanitina wal qanitati for devout men and women. Wa sadiqina wa sadiqati for true men and women. 
wal khashiin wal khashiyati for men and women who humble themselves wal sabirin wal sabirati for men and women who are patient and constant wal khashiin wal khashiyati for men and women who humble themselves so here we realize that this verse of the quran it is talking about for muslim men for believing women for women who are devout for women who are true for women who are sabr for men and women who pray so it is the same the duty the spiritual duty of men and women in islam is the same but i do know there are occasions when the woman when the woman is undergoing a cycles when she is undergoing a menstrual cycles there is relaxation given to her that because of the various psychological changes that takes place the various hormonal changes that takes place because of the menstrual cycle there is a concession given to women that during this time she should not pray she is giving rest so during these few days during a cycle there is relaxation that she she should not pray same with the fast she should not fast but the fast can be compensated because in ramadan you fast only for one month but since you have to offer salah five times a day every day of your life it need not be covered up so this is a concession given so that it is much more beneficial and she is comfortable hope that answers the question sister we'll have the second question from the same mic until the other mic is getting set we have asked for an additional mic there until it gets set we can have the second question from this mic later on we'll allow them to questions yes sister can i speak as any questioner on this mic no 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 can we have any volunteers confirming or reg no questions if there no question we will allow the brother here to ask the next question yes brother you have to end too before posing my question uh, i would like to thank the organizers for making such a brilliant and stupendous effort now coming to my question uh, i have a lot of interaction with muslims because my early childhood and uh, youth was spent among them but one question has always uh, been not really understood by me the definition of allah because to my mind and the way it has been given to me by my muslim friends and acquaintances that their definition of allah basically is negation of other faiths and also non acceptance of their definition of god as such your scholarship is very profound i would like to be benefited by it so we asked a very good question very important question that he wants to know one thing which has been always in his mind what is the definition of allah in islam and by definition the definition also includes many thing which is negation and it contradicts the definition of the other faiths in fact in islam the definition of allah says what allah is and also says what allah is not besides knowing what god is it is also important to know what god is not so that if someone falsely claims that so and so is god you can easily come to know this is a false claim as far as the reply to what is the definition of allah the best reply that any muslim can give you is from the quran from surah ikhlas chapter number 112 verse number 1 to 4 which says kul huwa allah ahad say he is allah one and only allahus samad allah the absolute and eternal lam yalid wa lam yulad he begets not nor is he begotten wa lam yakul lahu kuffan ad there is nothing like him this is a four line definition of allah subhanahu wa taala of almighty god given in the glorious quran this is the touchstone of theology it is the litmus test to identify any person says so and so candidate is god if that candidate fits in this four line definition we muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate to be god the first is qul huwallahu ahad says allah one and only 
Allah Samad, Allah the absolute and eternal, Lam Yulid Valam Yulad, he begets noise begotten, Walam Yakullahu Kufana, there is nothing like him. For example, I'll give you an example. There are some human beings who say that Bhagawan Rajneesh is God. During question and answer time, there was a Hindu brother who told me that if Hindus don't consider him to be God. I never said that the Hindus call Bhagawan Rajneesh to be God. There are many human beings who claim Bhagawan Rajneesh is God. Now I will give you a sample. Why do we use this negative also? Like say is Allah one and only positive? Allah Samad, Allah the Absolute Eternal, Lam Yalad Walam Yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Why do we use this? Now we put this Bhagavan Dajnish to test. The first test is, Kul Allah was. Says Allah one only. Was Bhagavan Dajnish one and only? Was he the only man who has claimed divinity? There are hundreds who have claimed divinity. And in this country of ours, India, there are thousands of men who have claimed divinity. Thousands of people have said that they are God. He's not the only one. But Rajneesh Bhakt will say, no, Bhagavan Rajneesh is unique. So okay, let's go to the next hello, hello. Allah Allahu Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Was Rajneesh absolute and eternal? When we read his autobiography, we read there that Bhagavan Rajneesh, he was suffering from asthma, from diabetes mellitus, from chronic backache. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma from diabetes mellitus, from chronic backache. The third test, Lam Yilid Valam Yulad. He begets not noise begotten. We know Bhagavad Nishnish. He was born in Madhya Pradesh. And he had a mother and father. And in 1981, he goes to America and takes thousands of Americans for a ride. And in the state of Oregon, he starts his new center known as Rajnishpuram. Later on, the American government arrests him and puts him behind bar. Rajneesh alleges that the American government gave me slow poisoning. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. And 1985, the American government kicking him out of the country. He comes back to India and goes back to the city of Pune. And there, he goes and restarts his center, which is today called as Osho Commune. And if you visit Osho Commune today, if you go to a Samadhi, where his ashes have been kept after he died. It is mentioned over there on a samadhi, on a, on a stone, O Sho, Bhagavan Rajnish, O Sho, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. Never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. They forgot to mention on his samadhi that he was not given visas to 21 different countries of the world. Imagine Almighty God coming on this earth to visit different countries and requires visas. And the last test, Walam Yakullahu Kufanad, is so stringent that the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. Walam Yakullahu Kufanad. We know Bhagavan Rajnish. He had a white beard. Like the human beings, they have two eyes, one nose, one mouth, two hands. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. For example, someone says that the Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You may have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title Mr. World, strongest man in the world, Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the universe. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, Dara Singh or King Kong, whether it be a thousand times or a million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. So this brother is, in short, the concept of Almighty God. As far as the second, question is con second part of the question is concerned, that why does it contradict with the concept of God in other religions. In fact, it is, it's a misconception that the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, it contradicts with the other religion. It contradicts against the practices of the other religion, I agree with you. But does not contradict against the other religious scriptures. Because unfortunately, the followers of most of the religions, whether it be Christianity, Hinduism, etc., they do not read their own scriptures. So if we analyze the practices 
of the non-Muslims, it does contradict. But if you go back to the scripture, if you have to understand the concept of God in any religion, the best is to try and find out what that scripture of that religion has to speak about God. Don't try and find out the concept of God by observing what the followers of the religions do. For example, if you want to know the concept of God is Sikhism, the best place you can go is Guru Granth Sahib, Adi Granth. If you read the first volume, first chapter, first verse of Guru Granth Sahib, it is known as Japuji. What does it say? Correct, known as Japuji. It says that God is one. He is called the true. He is called as eternal. He is uh, existent. He is compassionate. He is free from fear and want. And if you know in Sikhism, Sikhism believes in one God. It does not believe in idol worship. It does not believe in Avatar Vada. And in the manifest form, he is called as Omkara. And unmanifest form, he is called as Ekomkara. And if you read the scriptures of Sikhism, there are various attributes given to Almighty God. If you read the six scriptures, Almighty God, He is called as Satanama, He is called as Holy Name. He is called as Kartar, the Creator. He is called as Rahim, Merciful. He is called as Kareem, Beneficent. He is also called as Wahe Guru, the one true God. So if you go back to the scripture, the concept of God in Sikhism and Islam is the same. Similarly, if you go to Hinduism, in Hinduism also, if you go back to the Hindu scriptures, it's clearly mentioned in the Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1, Ikkam Evidityam, God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Sveta Siddha Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9, Nacha Sekasaj, Janita Nachadipa, of that God, there are no parents, he has got no superior, he has got no lord. It's mentioned in Sveta Siddha Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, as well as Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, Na Trasya Pratima Asti, of that God, there is no Pratima. Pratima in Sanskrit means, it means an image, a photograph, a painting, a picture, a portrait, an idol, a statue, a sculpture. So it says, Na Trasya Pratima Asti, of that God, there is no image, there is no painting, there is no portrait, there is... No photograph, no sculpture, no idol, no statue. But unfortunately, yet you find that Hindus are doing idol worship. Who's to blame? I'm quoting the Vedas. Vedas is the highest authority amongst all the Hindu scriptures. But yet you find that Hindus do idol worship. Why? Because the scholars of Hinduism, they tell that, see, brother Zakir, you know, at the lower level, People don't understand, so for concentration we require the ideal. When we reach a higher level of consciousness, then ideal is not required. So I tell this Hindu Pandit, we Muslims have already reached the higher level of consciousness. It is the basis of Hinduism, basis of Vedas. But there are some sects in Hinduism, like Arya Samaj, which completely denounce idol worship. So similarly, if you go to Christianity, if you read the Christian scriptures, Christian scriptures are again idol worship. Yet you find that the Catholics, they make an image of God and they say, Jesus Christ, peace be upon the Almighty God. If you go to Judaism, so what we realize that if you go to the Christian scriptures, the Christianity and Islam, the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is similar. But most of the Christians, what they claim that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God, always worship me. If any Christian can point out any unequivocal, any unambiguous statement in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, always worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's clearly mentioned. It's mentioned in Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, My father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29. My father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28. 
I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I with the finger of God cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, the will of Almighty God is a Muslim. So Jesus Christ peace be upon him, he was a Muslim. He never claimed divinity. And it's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. E men of Israel, Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. So if you read the Bible, even in Judaism and Christianity, they believe in one God who has got no images. It's clearly mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter number 5, verse number 7 and 8. It says that thou shalt have no other God besides me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any image, any graven image of anything, of any likeness in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, thy God, thy Lord is a jealous God. For more details, you can listen to the talk of my son. Tomorrow my son at 3.45 is going to be a detailed talk. This was just highlights. On the same topic, concept of God in major world religions. And you'll find out it is the same. We believe in one God who has got no images and we worship him alone and no one else. Hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. And uh, you said it for me because the definition of God as it is uh, tallies exactly with Islam, whatever we have in uh, Sikhism, you know. Can I have another quick one? Next time. We'll have the next question from the gents mic in the middle. That we'll call that mic two. This is mic number one. That is mic number two in the middle. The third mic is called mic number three, gents rear section. We have mic number one of the ladies front section right in front of me, and we have one on the side and little on the rear. That's mic number two for the ladies section. Yes, may we have the question on mic number two, gents middle. Yes, brother. Yeah, my name is Arjun J. Ra. I'm 19 years old. Different people are at different levels of spiritual level and refinement and understanding. I think Islam is for people who are already quite advanced at the spiritual understanding. Not everybody can follow its teachings meaningfully. Comparing it to a school, I mean people are like at first standard, second standard, and at 10th. Islam is like ninth standard curriculum. So am I right, the Islam is all, only for those who are already spiritually advanced? Well, I asked a very good question, that when we compare all the religions, Islam is at a higher level, advanced level. Like in a school, the other religion may be you know, kindergarten, first standard, Islam is ninth and tenth at the higher level. Is he right? I do agree with you. Agree as well as disagree. Agree that yes, Islam is for those who are spiritually high. But that does not mean a person who is not spiritually advanced, he cannot enter Islam. I disagree with that. Why? Because normally for everyone, anyone who enters school, if he enters the English school, the first thing he learns is what? He learns the alphabet of that language. Suppose he is entering school, which is an English medium school, in nursery he will learn a, B, C, D. Correct? So, in Islam, even if a person is not spiritually high, when he enters school, the minimum he should follow is Tawheed. The basic A, B, C, D of English language is comparable to Tawheed of any religion. In Tawheed, it is, Tawheed means believing in one God. So what I was describing earlier, when our Sikh brother asked the question about the concept of God, that is the basic. And that basic is present in every religion. But unfortunately, those people who are the religious leaders, they don't want people to follow that. Because if they follow that, who will follow the religious leader? If everyone starts worshipping one God, then all these religious leaders will not be required. There is no intermediary required. In all the other religions, you require an intermediary, a pandit, a priest, a guru. Here it is direct between you and your creator. 
So all the religions have the same basic message, which is then Islam. But unfortunately, the religious leaders, they don't want their followers to know this. They want to keep them away because if they enter the school, finally they will submit their will to God. Submit their will to God means become Muslim. And then these intermediaries, they will lose their job. You know, they'll have to close their shops down. So that's the reason. Otherwise, all the religious scriptures, even though they have been changed, the Almighty God, He got only one religion for all the human beings. But by the passage of time, the scriptures kept on changing. Even after the scriptures have changed, there have been interpolation, there has been fabrication, there has been concoction. Yet, in the remnants of all the religious scriptures, you find the message of Tawheed, of one God, that idol worship is prohibited, you worship Him. There may be other contradictory remarks also. But if you search for the truth and you find, so what I say, irrespective, the moment you, be, the moment you realize that there's a creator which I shall discuss tomorrow in detail, then you realize what is the purpose of your life. And then the initial nursery and the kindergarten of every spiritual aspect, every religion is believe in one God and he alone deserves worship. So anyone who's not even spiritually advanced, the moment he wants to thank his creator, he submits his will and a person who submits his will, he's called as a Muslim. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother in the rear, Mike 3. I am from Karnataka, Hubli. I am a, doing job as a manager as a medical distributor. My question is, where is that one? What happened to them? Thank you. Sorry, I didn't get a question. Where is the one and what happened? Where, where is the dead one? Where what happened the, to them? Where is the? Dead one. Dead person. Dead, 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 yeah, one. Yeah, ah. dead one. Brother asked the question, where are the dead people and what has happened to them? I heard dead one, bad one, I'm wondering what was. <laughs> so what, where are the dead people, what happened to them? As I mentioned in my earlier answers, that Allah has created death and life. Allah says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allazi khalakal mawta wal hayata. Allazi, that Almighty God has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. So this life is the test for the hereafter. Now once a person dies, his test is over. The test is finished. But the results of all the human beings, from the first human being on the face of the earth, from Adam, peace be upon him, till all of us that are living, as well as till the last human being going to live, all will be resurrected on the day of judgment. And the results will be declared together. You know how we have, you know, for example, here we have voting. Voting takes place in North India, separate date, South India, separate date, East India, separate date. But the counting starts together and the results are declared together. So similarly here, this test has taken place, but the Malik of Madini is the master of the Day of Judgment. The Day of Judgment will be together. Hisab Kitab. Who's right, who's wrong will take place together and then depending upon your good deeds or bad deeds, have you obeyed the commandments of the Prophet, the commandments of Almighty God or not, you may go to heaven or hell. So all of us would be resurrected. At present, they are dormant. Dormant, that means they have died, but they'll be resurrected. Almighty God will give them life again on the day of judgment. So all the human beings will be resurrected. And on the day of judgment, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter 6, that no one would object to the justice of Almighty God. Because our organs will be our witness, our eyes will give witness, our hand will give witness about ourselves. So even those who will be put in hell, if they have not followed the commandments, the Quran says, they will not object to the justice of Almighty God, they will say, give us one more chance, and Almighty God will say, it is too late. The exam is over. So on the day of judgment, all be resurrected, depending upon a good deed, bad deed, you will pass or you will fail, you will go to heaven or hell. Hope that answers the question, brother. Yes, sister, mic one. Good evening, sir. My name is Sejal Yadav. My question is, sir, the Muslim brethren in India, why do they refrain from saying one day mataram? And what is the reason? I mean, one day mataram is a thing which uh, 
uh, symbolizes Indian nationalists and does, doesn't have a religious identity. Sister, were you there yesterday you were there in the program? No, sir. Ah, because this question was asked by another sister yesterday. But since you were not yesterday, I repeat my answer. The sister asked the question that why do Muslims refrain from saying Mande Mataram? Before I give the answer why, why do Muslims refrain, I would give some advice that even the Hindus should refrain. Why? Because it goes against the scriptures. As I mentioned earlier, in the earlier answer when our Sikh brother he asked the question, I gave you quotations from Upanishad, from Veda, that Almighty God should worship Him alone and no one else. He has got no images. Now, Vande Mataram is a song in which thrice it says that Vande Mataram, I bow down to my motherland. Now, in Hinduism, you worship only Almighty God and no one else. God is the creator of this country also. Fine? So it goes against your scriptures. And, is, and Hinduism is against idol worship. Hinduism says you bow down only to Almighty God and no one else. You worship Him alone, no one else. So besides Muslim, first I would like to say it goes against the Hindu scriptures. You ask any Hindu scholar, if you ask a layman or a laywoman who is unaware of the Hindu scriptures, they may not know it goes against. Coming to nationality, I will tell you afterwards. As far as Muslims are concerned, again this verse, one day Mataram, it goes even against the Quran. Because in Islam, we worship only Almighty God and no one else. And this country, this country India, we Muslims, we love the country, we respect the country. We follow the laws of the country. As long as the law of the country do not go against the law of the Creator Almighty God, we have no objection in following any law of any country. But if the law of the country contradicts against the law of Almighty God, then we don't follow. So Almighty God is the creator of this country. So who should be bound to the country or to Almighty God? As far as India is concerned, most of us Muslims, we love the country, we respect the country. If required for the truth, we are ready to die for the country, but we will not bow to the country. Why? Because it goes against the law of the Creator. Similarly, no Saudi should bow to Saudi Arabia also. Don't think this is only by Indian Muslims. In Saudi Arabia, a Saudi will never bow down to Saudi Arabia. In Pakistan, a Pakistani Muslim will never bow down to Pakistan. It is not a special law for India because Saudi Arabia is not superior than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pakistan, the name may be Pak, but it is not superior to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this law is the same. And the concept is that we too love the country. But if it contradicts, for example, in Islam, we consider after Allah and the Messenger, in this world, the person who we respect maximum is our mother. Our mother bore us in a womb for nine months. We love her. We respect her, we have to die for her, but we can't bow down to her also. When I cannot bow down to my biological mother, where is the question of me to bow down to this land? Why? Because neither my biological mother, neither this land of mine is superior to the Creator. Furthermore, there are 12 lines in the Vande Mataram. Three is Vande Mataram, which is against Quran and Hadith. Similarly, there are attributes given to Almighty God, about Durga, about Lakshmi, about wealth, etc., which contradicts against the concept of Islam. So because it goes against, it is belittling God. So I will not belittle my Creator just for this country. But I love the country. That does not mean that I do not love the country. And this song was written by whom? It was written by Bankim Chakabadia. For what? It was a political move. And now a few years back, they want to create a century and they don't even know the date when it is written down. It is more for political motives that the Indian politicians want to make a thing. But these Hindu Indian politicians don't know that they are going against their own Veda by making a political issue. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. Yes.
the, I, I hope the next mic is working. We'll allow two questions at that mic because in the last round it was just being set up. Yes, sister. Two questions from that mic. First one sister, the sister after that can ask the second question. Good evening, sir. I wanted to ask few questions regarding medical fee. Basically, is family planning allowed in Islam? And why generally people prefer MTP, that is medical termination of pregnancy, rather than your TL? And it's very difficult to convince them. For a TL, it's very easy for them to do a MTP. Why is it so? Sister, being a medical doctor, she has given some short form the MTP, TL, which may go monster to the most of the audience, but I being a medical doctor, I know what she's meaning. This is another question about the concept of family planning in Islam and why it's easier to convince the Muslim to do MTP means medical termination of pregnancy rather than TL. TL means tubal ligation. That is a permanent method of family planning. So I club both together. As far as family planning is concerned, it's a very big concept, planning the family. And mainly people plan the family and they want to prevent having children, etc. So what does Islam say about this? As far as family planning is concerned, all permanent methods, whether it be tubal ligation, TL, what you mentioned, whether it be vasectomy, any permanent method of family planning in Islam is prohibited. Secondly, any abortion, any MTP, medical termination of pregnancy, it is prohibited because you're killing a life. Unless it is a danger for the life of the mother. If the mother's life is in danger, that maybe she has multiple cesarean section. And if the doctors say that she has had four or five cesarean section, one more cesarean section means detrimental to her life, or she has some heart problem and she cannot take the strain of undergoing one more pregnancy. So in this case, the Islamic Sharia says, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. The life of the mother is more important than the life that is going to come in this world. In this situation, these methods can be used as a last resort. Any permanent method, whether it be tubal ligation, whether it be vasectomy, whether it be medical termination of pregnancy, only in these cases. Any other cases, it is not allowed. Why? I'll tell you later on. As far as the other methods, one of the most common methods is the copper tea. A copper tea, why it's prohibited, all these methods? Because Quran clearly states in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 151, that kill not your children for want of sustenance, for it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will give sustenance to you and your children. Allah repeats that message in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 31. Kill not your children for want of sustenance, for it is Allah who will give sustenance to your children and you. For killing of children is a major sin. So based on this, killing any human being is prohibited. Even the life that's going to come in this world, all types is prohibited. As far as the other temporary methods are concerned, there are different opinions in the scholars. First, the most common, as I mentioned, is the copper tea. Now, in copper tea, when I was in the medical college, I was taught that it is a contraception. But what happens in the copper tea? The copper tea prevents the ovum and the sperm have already joined to form the zygote. But the copper tea prevents the zygote from, click, from clinging on the uterine wall, on the wall of the womb of the mother. So it is nothing but a very early abortion. So Islamically, those people who know about the medical science, even copper tea is prohibited. As far as there may be difference in the other temporary method, whether it be condom, whether it be other method, once a person came to the Prophet and told him that I used to do uz, that is coitus interruptus. I used to stop the act so that the fluid doesn't enter the body of the wife. And the Prophet was silent. Those people who are in favor of certain temporary method, they say, Prophet was silent, he gave permission. The other group, Prophet was silent, he didn't give permission, different opinion. But I go back. Why, what is the reason that a person wants to do family planning is my basic question. 
See, normally a doctor, when a person has a headache, you give aspirin, you give crocin. It is not a cure. It is a symptomatic treatment that the threshold of pain is increased, so you don't feel the pain. But that is not actually curing the disease. The best way to cure is to kill the germs. So first let us find out why do different human beings want to do family planning? Whatever reason you have, you can broadly club them into two broad categories. The first category is for poverty. You know, I'm poor. If I have many children, I cannot make, you know, I will, for me to live itself, hand to mouth. If I have children, then I will also die. The other group, they are rich. I have no problem about money, about money, but I want to make my son a doctor. I want to make my son an engineer. You know, so they were family planning, so I can upbring my children better. Inshallah, we will discuss both the cases. As far as the first case is concerned, regarding those people who are poor, Islam has a solution to this problem. In Islam, the third pillar of Islam is zakat. That is, every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity every lunar year. If every rich human being gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. So if your problem is poverty, Islam has a solution. And the person who takes zakat, he is not being degraded. And the person who is wealthy and giving zakat, he is not doing a favor on the poor man. Because God gave him wealth, it is his duty. He is not doing a, he is not doing a favor on the poor people. And the poor people when they take, it is not that it is an obligation they have. It is their right. So if poverty is the problem, we have a solution of compulsory charity that is zakat. If every rich human being in the world gives charity, poverty will be eradicated, there will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. Now the verses of the Quran I quoted earlier, two verses. Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 151 and Surah Isra chapter 17 verse number 31. On the face of it, both appear similar, but there is a difference of chalk and cheese. The first verse of Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 151 says, Kill not your children for want of sustenance, for it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will give sustenance to you and your children. Surah Al-Isra chapter 17 verse number 31 says, Kill not your children for want of sustenance, for it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will give sustenance to your children and you. The order is reversed. First verse says, you and your children. Surah Isra says, your children and you. On the face of it, it's the same. Now why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reverse the order? Everything has a hikmah behind it. So the scholars, the mufassirin, what they say, the first verse, Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 151, refers to the poor people. You know, if you have more children, even I will die, and even my children will die. So Almighty God says, don't worry, it kill not your children for want of sustenance. It is Allah that will give sustenance to you and your children. The first verse refers to the poor people. The second was for the rich people, I have got no problem of money, but if I, if I have spacing, if I have less children, I'll make them doctors, I'll make them engineers. So Allah says, kill not your children for want of sustenance. It is Allah who will give sustenance to your children and you. Order is reversed. Now what is the solution for people who are rich? That's the second category. Just for your knowledge, I would like to tell you that I am the fifth child of my parents. If my parents would have done family planning, I would have been here. Do you think I am a boon or a bane for society? You know, in the world, in society, best profession, doctor, medical doctor. Best is medical doctor, nothing better than that. Alhamdulillah, even after being the fifth child, I became a medical doctor. But, I became a doctor to serve humanity, but when I found a better profession, Allah says in Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 33, وَمَنْ أَحَسَنُ كَوَلَ مِمَّنْ دَوَيْلَ اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَوْلِحَوْمْ كَوَلَ إِنَّ نِبْنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I am a Muslim? When I found a better profession, I changed from a doctor of body to a doctor of soul. If I was a medical doctor, I am surely there is more than a lakh people here. They wouldn't have come for my talk. They have come because I have changed from a doctor of a body to a doctor of soul. I am asking you, 
I am the fifth child of my parent. Am I a boon or am I a bane for society? People have a misconception that if you have less children, you can have spacing and you can bring them up well. If you check the list of all the Nobel Prize winners and people who have got awards, best in world, best in science, best in sports, they aren't the first child. They are not the only children. Some may be. Some are second child, some are third, some are fifth. It's mixed. It's a misconception. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a natural method of spacing. In Islam, moment a child is born, the mother should breastfeed the child. But today in modern world, you know, they don't want to breastfeed because they spoil their figure. The best food according to medical science that you can give to your child is the best milk. And if you breastfeed your child, automatically there is lactation amenuria. You being a doctor, you know, there is lactation amenuria. That means she will not conceive. Though it's not 100% safe, but the chances she'll conceive is very little. So automatically, Almighty God has given spacing. And population, sister, it is not a bane, it is boon. You know, we say in our country in India, hum do hamare do. We too and our too. Ek ke baad abhi nahi, do ke baad kabhi nahi. After one, not now, after two, never. So these are slogans in India because Indian government doesn't know how to take care of the population. If you go to America, the children wear a t-shirt. I am my father's tax saver. The more children you have, the less tax they have to pay. You go to Australia, you go to Canada. The moment a child is born, the government gives them allowance. Every child, every month you get allowance. So the government of US, Canada, Australia, they are encouraging population. Why is the government of India discouraging? So it's problem with the government policies, it is not with population. And do you know today, the two countries which are competing for being superpower is China and India. China has the maximum population in the world, India is number two. Today, India and China are competing to be population, they are competing to be the superpower. Why? Because both of them have got manpower. When I say manpower, it means human power, it includes the women also. China and India have got human power. That is the reason today, you find America coming here to invest money, you find the Westerners coming to invest money here, you see the stock market going high. Why? Because of population. So population, it is a boon, it is not a bane. So even if you want to make your children doctors and engineers, don't think you never know your fifth child may become a doctor or your second child. It is not that if you have more children, then you can space them better. Now there's a third category, a unique category, once someone told me, that was a Zakir. I'm rich. I'm not bothered about bringing up children. You know, I'm rich, so no problem of money. And I'm not bothered about making my son, you know, a doctor or engineer. I want to enjoy life. Third category. So I told him, even for you, if you want to enjoy life, the best is marry early, have children early, so that you can retire early. You know, there are certain communities in India, you know, Gujaratis and all, they marry early, 19, 20, 21, they have children immediately, by the time they reach 35 to 40, their children, they are on the seat of the business. So at the age of 40, they can retire, they retire at the age of 60 and 70. At the age of 40, their children are taking care of the business, they can enjoy life. So even if you want to enjoy life, marry early, have children, relax and enjoy life. Therefore, personally, as far as my opinion is concerned, I believe with those group, those group of scholars, as far as family planning is concerned, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 54, makar Allahu wallahu khairul makreen. They planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planners. So if you think you can plan the family better, you're most welcome. I leave the planning of the family in the hands of a creator. It is the best. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. This is next question from the same mic, ladies rare section. Mic number two. The second question from the same mic. Although we don't have any non-Muslim sisters. Okay, then we. I would request uh, any of the non-Muslim sisters that are available anywhere close by. If you'd like to ask a question, you can quickly get up and get on the mic. Just wait for about 
three seconds or I move to the next mic. Any of the sisters that they are requested, if you have any specific question, you are most welcome. Any critical question on Islam or you want clarification on Islam, this is your opportunity, Dr. Zakir is here. Most welcome to go on the mic and put forward your question. I came from Nagpur. I want to ask you one question about Vedas. Because I believe Vedas are main scripture of Hinduism. So I want to know if you are telling or putting a common point which is similar to other scripture, why you do not put different points in front of non-Muslim people which are contradictable or which are opposite to each other. Because I believe in common point as a being a Hindu girl, it is very important to know which are the common point and which are the different points in Hinduism scriptures. She said that I quoted the Vedas, I did point out similarities, why don't I speak about differences? And she wants to know the similarities as the differences. Sister, if I can give a talk on similarities between Islam and Hinduism for a few hours, I can give a bigger talk and a longer talk on differences between Islam and Hinduism. But the reason I chose to speak about similarities, because that is the advice given by my creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran. Chapter number three, verse number sixty-four, which says, "Kul ya hilal kitab." Say, O people of the book, "Talo ila kalimatin sawa imbayna baynakum." Come to common terms, as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na abda illa Allah. That we worship none but Allah. Walla nushika bihi shayyon. That we associate no partners with Him. Walla yatakhida baad dun baad dun arba bun min dun illa. That we erect not among ourselves lords and pets other than Allah. Fa inta walla. If then they turn back. Fakul shadu. Say e bear witness. We are not Muslim. That we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the Quran shows us a way how to speak with different kinds of people. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? The most important term is Allah. Na'udha illallah. That we worship none but one Almighty God. Regarding differences, sister, I can give a talk for hours together about differences. Not that I can't. But it will, it will bring animosity. Maybe it will hurt the feelings of someone. That we may be forced to do during a debate. When there is a debate, you know, for example, I had a debate with a person by the name of Dr. William Campbell. He, you heard that talk? Did you heard that talk, sister? Yeah, I have seen your videos. Ah, so that talk was talking about differences between Christianity and Islam. Why? He wrote a book saying there are 30 scientific errors in the Quran. And for eight years no Muslim replied. In USA it became a hot seller. So the students of US, they called me and we had a dialogue. The topic was Quran and Bible in the light of science. Whatever allegations they had against the Quran, I replied to all. I posed 38 points from the Bible, which is against science. He could not reply to any. So in a debate, I may have to do that. If I have a debate with a Hindu scholar who says that, you know, Vedas are completely with, about science. So then I can talk about the unscientific thing. I'll just give you a sample. I don't intend giving a talk on the unscientific mention in the Veda. If you read Yajur Veda, it says that the sun in the chariot, it takes circles around the earth. That means the sun is revolving around the earth. It's unscientific. You may have read in school that the sun does not take circles around the earth. It was the old philosophy. So this is unscientific. Nowhere does the Quran say that. So what we realize, but if I talk about differences, maybe you may feel offended. So if you want to go on a higher level, surely you can ask queries at IRF. We'll give you all the things, but in public, I personally don't want to talk about contradiction unless someone forces me. Not that we aren't aware, but if you know the similarity, what I'm telling you, let us agree to follow what is common. So, what I tell the people, what is common in the Vedas, in the Bible, in the Quran, let everyone agree that at least one book is the word of God. Hindus will say, Veda is the word of God, Christians will say, Bible is the word of God, Muslims will say, the Quran is the word of God. I tell them a thing which everyone wouldn't mind agreeing. Let us agree to follow what is common. 
So when you follow the commonalities in the Vedas, in the Bible, in the Jewish scriptures, Talmud, in the Quran, we find all the scriptures say there is one God. All the scriptures say the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So I am asking you, sister, why don't you believe in one God? I want to ask you the question, sister. Do you believe in idol worship? Yeah, I am believing. Do you believe there is one God? Yeah, I believe in one God. Do you believe, that's why, that's why. and do you believe, sister, that the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Just because I am asking you the question, because it is very difficult to uh, understand uh, Quran and Vedas. And I am so much confused which uh, scripture is more important for me to uh, achieve um, uh, to the God. I mean, to worship to the God. I have heard a lecture on similarity between Islam and Hinduism or yeah. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hindu scriptures. Have you heard that? Yeah, I have heard. Do you know that your scripture says that the last and final messenger is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Yeah. Do you know that? Yeah. So do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? Yeah, definitely. Do you believe? Yeah. So if you believe there is one God, God, and you believe that idol worship is prohibited, and if you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the last messenger, in Arabic we call you as a Muslim. Sister, do you believe in one God? Yeah, I believe in one God. Do you believe there is no idol worship? Do you believe that Almighty God has got no images? Yeah. You believe that? Yeah. And you also believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God. So what you have entered, you may not have gone very high, but by saying this that there is no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger, you indirectly become a Muslim. Muslim means a person who submits his will to God. So do you yeah, submit to but I am indirectly Muslim, no? If uh, Veda is telling the same thing and uh, Quran telling the same thing, so yes. which... If you are indirect also, no problem. Indirect also, you are most welcome. Whether you come direct or indirect, we welcome you, sister. Now, you know what is coming. Now, if your Veda says that the last and final messenger is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and you have to follow him, so by following Prophet Muhammad, you are indirectly following the Veda also. Then you have to find out what did Prophet Muhammad say. Then you have to read the hadith. But slowly, slowly. So now you are in nursery, then junior kg, then senior kg, then first standard, then you will reach standard 10. But have you taken admission? I want to know. That do you, do you agree that you are a Muslim? Muslim means a person who submits his, will, his or her will to God. Why it is important that the person who is uh, believing in one God, uh, he is called or she is called a Muslim? Yes, why? Muslim means a person who submits his will to God. And the first important creed to submit your will to God is, believe there is one God, believe there is no idol worship, and believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger. If you say this, that means you have agreed to submit. And then it takes time. Then you go to standard one, then slowly you may know what is required about fasting, about charity, not to rob, not to steal. All this comes later. But do you agree to submit your will is important. And do you agree to follow the teachings of Prophet Muhammad is important what I want to ask you, sister. Yeah, I agree. So would you like to say the Shahada? Shahada means would you like to say in Arabic that there is no God but one God and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger. Yeah, there is a one God and uh, the Prophet. Prophet Muhammad is the last Prophet. MashaAllah. MashaAllah, sister. Congratulations. I would just say it in Arabic and I want you to repeat it. You know what you have said is the same thing. But I want to ask you, sister, is anyone forcing you to say this? No, no one. Is there no putting pressure? No. It is completely out of your free will? Yeah. Okay, sister, I say in Arabic, just repeat it. Ashadu. Ashadu Allah Allah Ilaha Ilaha Illallah Illallah Wa Ashadu Wa Ashadu Wa Ashadu Anna Anna Muhammadan Muhammadan Abduhu Abduhu Wa Rasuluhu Wa Rasuluhu I bear witness I bear witness I bear witness That there is no God that there is no God but Allah, but Allah and Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him peace be upon him is the servant is the servant and messenger of and, Allah and messenger of Allah. Mashallah. Thank you.
I congratulate your sister. Now we have entered the fall of Islam, and inshallah, for getting more knowledge, for going to first standard, second standard, third standard, be in touch with the sisters of the Islamic Research Foundation, and it will be a pleasure to guide you. And if you have any queries regarding Quran, regarding Islam, you are most welcome to ask. If you have any queries even regarding Hinduism, etc., most welcome, sisters. And and I pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that may He grant you Jannah, sister. Thank you, sir. The next question would be from this mic, but before that, may I just mention a point? Uh, we have some sisters, what I realize in the mic, they come after some time. Uh, I would encourage some of our volunteers to kindly see that those who are interested in putting forward question on the mic are encouraged and uh, welcomed on the mic, open-heartedly. Secondly, those who do not like to come on the mic, you can kindly pass on the question slips to them. They can write their question on the slip. And uh, you should see that through the volunteers, it comes to a gen section and onto the stage. So I would be most happy to read out those questions. We respect their privacy, inshallah. We now we have the next question from the brother on mic number one in the front. Assalamu alaikum, Jagir Sahib. My name is Dilip Trivedi. I am Mumbai. I am from Islam. I am from Islam. I am from Islam. लेकिन मेरे एक मित्र है सिकंदर भाई और आयसा बहन उन्होंने मुझे कुरान दी और मैंने एक महीने तक लगातार गुजराती में उसको पढ़ा तो मैं काफी इम्प्रेस हो गया फिर हमारे सिकंदर भाई ने मुझे काफी कैसेट्स वगैरह सुनाई उससे मैं काफी इम्प्रेस हुआ और मुझे खुशी हुई कि इस्लाम के बारे में जो सनातन सत्य है जो तत्व ज्ञान है वो मुझे मिला और आपसे मैं चाहता हूं कि कलमा पढ़ना चाहता हूं ही रिसीव द कुरान फ्रॉम हिज फ्रेंड्स एंड ही अंडरस्टूड ग्रास्ट विद एंड ही इज वेल ही अंडरस्टैंड द मैसेज ऑफ द कुरान एंड इस्लाम एंड नाउ यू राइट लाइक टू रीड द कलमा द शहादा Mashallah. Welcome the brother. He said that he read the Quran for more than a month. Then he was given some cassettes, and he was impressed by that, and he realized the oneness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and that's the reason he wants to accept Islam. Brother Dilip, I would like to ask you that is anyone forcing you to accept Islam? Who is forcing you to accept Islam? No. No. Do you want to accept Islam with your own free will? Yes. Mashallah. Do you want to accept Islam with your own free will? Yes. Mashallah. मैं आपको कहूंगा अरबी में और आप उसको दोहराइए इंशाला अशदु अशरु अशदु अशहरु अशहदु अल्लाह अल्लाह इलाहा इलाहा इल्लाह इल्लाह वह अशदु वह शल्लु मोहम्मदन वह अशदु वह शल्लु अशदु अल्लाह इलाह इल्लाह वह अशदु अन्ना मोहम्मदन मोहम्मदन अब्दुहु Abduhu wa Rasuluhu wa Rasuluhu Mashallah Mai shahadat deta hoon Mai shahadat Mai shahadat deta hoon Ke Ke Allah ke siwa Allah ke siwa Koi maabud nahi Koi maabud nahi Or Or Muhammad Muhammad Sallallah Sallallah Alayhi wa sallam Alayhi wa sallam Uske Uske Bande Bande Or paigambar hai Paigambar hai Mashallah The brothers accept the Islam اور میں اللہ سبحانہ سے دعا کرتا ہوں کہ اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی آپ کی جد و جہد کو قبول فرمائیں اور آپ کے محنت کو قبول فرمائیں اور انشاءاللہ آپ کو اسلام کے بارے میں اگر کوئی زیادہ جانگاری چاہتے ہیں تو آپ انشاءاللہ آئرف کے ٹچ میں رہ سکتے ہیں اور کچھ بھی آپ کو سوالات ہے اسلام کے بارے میں تو آپ ایمیل پہ پوچھ سکتے خود بھی آ سکتے ڈونگری پہ ہمارا ادارہ ہے اور میں اللہ سے دعا کروں گا کہ اللہ تعالی انشاءاللہ آپ کو ج अच्छा सा नाम मुझे दे। The brother has requested that I should suggest some good name for him. The name that I can think जो मैं नाम जो मेरे दिमाग में अभी आ रहा है, वो है बिलाल। तब इंशाल्लाह अपने आप को बिलाल कह सकते हैं। तमाम भाई बहनों से मेरी गुजारिश है कि मेरे लिए दुआ करें। इंशाल्लाह। He requests all the brothers and sisters present here as well as who are watching Peace TV. Mashallah, 10 crore log. 100 million people are watching, so we so I request 
all the brothers and sisters present here and the viewers of Peace TV that please do pray for our brother and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he grant you Jannah. Thank you. Amen. Next question from the brother in the center, Mike 2. The brother asked the question that is it compulsory to accept Islam to go to Jannah? It is like asking that should I get good marks to pass the examination? If you want to pass the examination, you should minimum get passing marks. As far as to go to Jannah, to go to Jannah, the criteria to go to Jannah is mentioned in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, which says, Wal Asr. Inna al insana la fi khus, illa ladin amanu, wa amiru salihati, wa tawasaw bil haqqa, tawasaw bil sabr. By the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. For any human being to go to Jannah, minimum four criteria are required. Minimum. First is having faith, having Iman. In Iman will come believing in one God, not doing shirk, believing Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the last messenger, etc., etc. Second is righteous deed. Besides having faith, Iman ke alawa, righteous deed, amal e salihat. The third is watawa saubil haq, inviting people to truth. And the fourth is inviting people to patience and perseverance. For any human being to go to Jannah, minimum four criteria is required. And if Allah wishes, He may forgive any sin. But the sin of shirk He will never forgive. Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48 and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116 that if Allah pleases He may forgive any sin but the sin of shirk He will never forgive. For anyone who has committed shirk, He has committed a heinous sin. So shirk is a major sin. If you do shirk, there is no chance of entering Jannah at all. Other sin if Allah wishes He may forgive. But for being sure that you go to Jannah, minimum four criteria is required. Iman, righteous deed, exhorting people to the truth and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. Bhai sahab, I want to ask you a question. Do you want to enter Jannah? Do you want to go to Jannah? Yes. Do you want to go to Jannah? I'm saying this for you. I'm saying this for you. I'm saying this for you. MashaAllah. So, Jannah, Jannah, Vash. The brother wants to go to Jannah and he wants to read the Kalma. Is anyone forcing you to accept Islam, brother? Is anyone doing this for you? No. 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 بدھ پرستی بدھ پرستی کرنا غلط ہے آپ مانتے اس کو بدھ پرستی آئیڈل موشن آہ غلط ہے غلط ہے آپ مانتے ہیں کیا محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم آخری پیغمبر ہے محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم پیغمبر ہے اللہ کیا آپ مانتے ہیں مانتے ہیں ماشاءاللہ سو میں انشاءاللہ میں کلمہ پڑھاؤں گا اور آپ اس کو دورہ ہے اور انشاءاللہ میں دعا کروں گا اللہ آپ کو جنت میں دالے یس تینک یو اشہدو اشہدو اللہ اللہ الہا الہا الا اللہ الا اللہ و اشہدو و اشہدو انہ محمدن محمدن عبدہو عبدہو و رسولہو و رسولہو میں گوائی دیتا ہوں میں گوائی دے رہا ہوں میں گوائی دیتا ہوں میں گوائی دیتا ہوں کہ اللہ کے علاوہ اللہ کی علاوہ کا کوئی معبود نہیں کوئی معمود نہیں معبود نہیں معبود نہیں اور اور محمد محمد صلی اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم علیہ وسلم اس کے بندے اس کے بندے اور پیغمبر ہے 
पैगम्बर है माशाला आप मुसलमान हो चुके सर जी हाँ मेरे एक नाम रख लो अच्छा द ब्रदर वॉन्ट टू सजेस्ट नीम रोड पे एक एक नाम पूछते हैं इसके लिए मेरे को भी बोलने नहीं आ रहा आपका नाम क्या है अभी मेरा नाम अजय कुमार अजय कुमार या भाई साहब का नाम अजय कुमार है तो मैं एक एक कोशिश करूंगा आप अपने आप को अब्दुल्ला बुला सकते हैं अब्दुल्ला मतलब सर्वेंट ऑफ गॉड यानी अल्लाह अल्लाह का इबादत कर अल्लाह के बंदे को कहते हैं अब्दुल्ला सर्वेंट ऑफ गॉड और मैं दुआ करूंगा कि अब्दुल्ला इंशाला अल्लाह तला आपको जन्नत में सी फरमाए आमीन थैंक यू आमीन आपके लिए दुआ मांगेगा इसकी जन्नत के लिए दुआ मांगेगा थैंक यू नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द माइक इन द रेयर सेक्शन ऑफ द जेंट्स माइक थ्री यस ब्रदर हेलो गुड इवनिंग आई एम डॉक्टर मैथ्यू एंड आई एम ऑल्सो इन्वॉल्व विद क्रिएशन डॉट कॉम विच इज पार्ट ऑफ क्रिएशन मिनिस्ट्रीज इंटरनेशनल बींग अ मेडिकल डॉक्टर आई केम हियर बिकॉज आई एम एज वेरी मच इंटरेस्टेड इन पीस and as you mentioned peace is both internal and external now personally when i and millions of other people have found after being convicted of our sin and repenting of it that and having accepted and believed that jesus christ the sinless man paid the full price for my sins he took my shame and guilt on the cross and died for me because of which i have peace and that peace is something which passes understanding i want to know would you like to take away that peace which i have which is a peace which passes understanding and can you answer that thank you brother that's a very good question he is dr matthew he will he is got a website and organization called creation he said that he found peace he came here to attain peace he said he got peace in in jesus christ peace be upon him who died for his sins on the cross he died for his sins on the cross he is asking me that would i like to take away your peace brother i would never like to take away your peace i would like to take away your false peace a false peace and make you get the true peace because jesus christ peace be upon him jesus christ peace be upon him we have to follow the teaching i love jesus christ peace be upon him i respect him and i revere him i want to know that do you also love jesus christ or not i am asking you yes do you agree yeah. do you believe that jesus is god yes yes brother now either you get true peace or i will come to your peace correct yes. if you are this true peace i will leave me my peace and i will join you yes Now you told me Jesus Christ peace be upon him is God. I challenge you to point out a single verse in the Bible, a single unequivocal verse from the Bible, a single unambiguous verse in which Jesus Christ peace be upon him himself says that I am God or where he says worship me and I am ready to accept Christianity. You said Jesus is God as far as Muslims are concerned. Islam is the only non-Christian faith. which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ peace be upon him no muslim is a muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ peace be upon him we believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of almighty god we believe that he was the messiah translated christ we believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention which many which many modern day christian do not believe we believe that he gave life to the dead with god's permission we believe he healed those born blind and lepers with god's permission the muslim and the christians are going together but the parting of ways is as you said that most of the christians they believe that jesus christ peace be upon him claim divinity there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete bible where jesus christ peace be upon him himself says that i am god or where he says worship me if you can point out i am ready to accept christianity so if you have not said that why do you believe he is god and where did jesus christ peace be upon him said that he died on the cross for your sin that is the teaching of paul are you following paul or are you following jesus christ peace be upon him no one in the bible so my question is when jesus christ never said he was god why are you believing him if you love him you have to respect him he said when you was asked which is the first of the commandment it's mentioned in the gospel of mark chapter number 12 verse number 29 he said shama israelo adnan haidman dai khad that your your israel 
the God, our Lord, is one God. He repeated verbatim what was said by Moses earlier. Peace be upon him. So what I am asking you, if you know the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. It is, if you say Christian is a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is mentioned in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18, that do not be drunk with wine. It's mentioned in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1, that wine is a mocker. Whoever deceives has it. We Muslims, we don't have alcohol, but many of the Christians have alcohol. Furthermore, we Muslims don't have pork. It's mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 to 5, that you should not have pork. We Muslims don't have pork, but Christians have pork, most of them. So. Furthermore, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was circumcised on the eighth day, according to, according to Gospel of Luke. We Muslims are circumcised, most of the Christians are not. If Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, I'm proud to say we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. So okay. where do you, you, you follow the teachings of Jesus Christ and you say that you worship him? So brother, point out a single verse in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said unequivocally that I am God or worship me. Dr. Zakir Naik. Yes, brother. My question was on peace and I have that peace. I don't have to memorize memory persons to prove or disagree with you. What I am sharing is that the peace which I have, because of the belief, because we are all sinners and we need a sacrifice to pay for our sins. It is not by our works that we are saved, Correct. but by believing in faith that Jesus Christ has paid the price for my sins. Fine. So you agree that Jesus Christ has paid for the sins of all humanity? Do you agree yes. with that? Yes. Okay. All yes. who believe in him. Okay, fine. So suppose a Christian comes like you, who believes in Jesus Christ and he rapes your wife, will he go to heaven or hell? Pardon? If a Christian hmm. comes and rapes your wife, he believes Jesus Christ died for a sin. So whatever sin he does, it is paid for it. So if no. Jesus Christ had died for a sin, it will give permission for all the Christians to rape the woman. Never, never. Why never? You said... Because if a person you, you believes... Told, you told... Be you, person, whether you told your work will not take you to heaven, it is your belief. So if you believe Jesus Christ died for your sin, and if you commit rape, if you rob, if you oppress other people, will you go to heaven? He is not a Christian. If he does that, simple. But he believes in Jesus Christ. There are many no. Christians who I know. That you, means it's a wrong belief. Correct? Even the, even Correct. The in the Bible also it is written that even the devils believe in Jesus Christ. Correct. They don't follow him. Correct. They don't for do you follow Jesus Christ? Please be upon him. Are you yes. circumcised? Yes, sir. Are, are you circumcised? Are you circumcised? No, I am not circumcised. So why don't you follow Jesus Christ? Please be upon him. Jesus Christ was circumcised on the eighth day. You're a doctor, correct? Yes. You know that circumcision is beneficial medically. So that was if not in my hands. It was in my parents' hands. So you can do it now also, no problem. Sure. If you want, I'll help you. Point number one. Yes. Point number two. Do you have pork, brother? No. You don't have pork. Why? It's mentioned in the Old Testament. Correct. And God has mentioned Do you have intoxicant? Do you have alcohol? No. Fine. Do you believe Jesus is God? Jesus Christ is God came on the earth as a human being. Where it is mentioned? Which verse of the Bible? Tell me. Which verse of the Bible? Where? Which verse I'm of sure. the Bible? Which verse of the Bible where Jesus Christ himself says he is God? Suppose someone tells you are God. Will you believe you are God? Someone no. says I am God. Will I believe? The Dr. point Dr. to be noted is that Jesus Christ never claimed divinity. In fact, if you go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 and 17, there's a person who comes to Jesus Christ and says, Good Master, what good things should I do so that I enter eternal life? So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, Why thou callest me good? Leave aside God. Why thou callest me good? There's only one good, and that is a God in heaven. And if you want to eternal, if you want to enter eternal life, you keep the commandment. He never said that if you want to go to paradise, you believe I'm God. He never said that you believe that I died on the cross for your sin. He said if you want to go to paradise, you keep the commandments. And the commandments are what? You should not rob, you should not have alcohol, you should not covet your neighbor's wife. Commandments, the deeds. The deeds will take you to paradise. Jesus Christ never said he was God. So why are you saying that Jesus is God, peace be upon him? You are not following his teachings also. I and didn't say that Jesus Christ is God for this argument. I just said that I have the peace in my heart. 
and that peace I want to share. Brother, there are many people, you know there's a Satan worshipping cult, do you know that? Are you aware? Satan worshipping cult. Correct. So they get peace by worshipping Satan, but that is false peace. Therefore, I want to take you out from false peace and make you enter true peace. What you're saying is peace is actually not peace. You are worshipping a false god. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, never said he was God. So because they are worshipping a false god and you are in the false peace, like people worship Satan and yet they think that they are on the right track, I want to get you out of the false peace and get you into true peace. Because I consider myself to be a true Christian. If Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then I am more Christian than the Christian self. Christian themselves. Do you know Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now, for he when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. Now which man, which prophet, after Jesus, has ever glorified Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ? It is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So this prophecy, of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in your Bible. There are several quotations. I am asking you, why don't you follow the instruction of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and why don't you follow Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? What kind of a Christian are you? Do you mean to say that I don't follow the follow teachings of Christians? Not at all. I'm giving you quotation with reference. You go back home and check the Bible with references. No. You are not a true Christian. I am a true Christian. It's easy to judge, brother. Easy, very easy. I'm giving you with quotation. What you're saying, you have not given a single quotation. I challenge your doctors of divinity. Doctors of divinity of Christendom. Anyone. Get your doctors of, doctors of divinity. If you say you don't have the knowledge, get your doctors of divinity. Who's the best in the world? And let us have a dialogue. Sure. But the person should be powerful, not just a roadside person, a person who can attract people, a yeah. person who has a following. You, you get the best one that you have in India, best one that you have in the world, and yeah. we'll have a dialogue. Yes, and you can ask him, and you ask him all the questions I've asked, that where is it mentioned in the Bible, any unequivocal statement where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says worship me. I, Dr. Zakin Naik, I am immediately accepting. If you can point out from any version of the Bible, any unequivocal statement, any unambiguous statement where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or worship me, I am ready to accept him to be God. But there is no statement. So what you are doing is you are not following the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. It is the teachings of the church, not of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So therefore I request you, brother, that please leave the false peace and enter into two priests. The true peace is submitting your will to God. God who created Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Not a false God. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a messenger of God, but he was not God. Hope that answers the question. Good evening, sir. My name is Simi. My question is, why are the, are the ladies not allowed to divorce their husbands in Islam? This is the question that why aren't the ladies allowed to divorce their husband? As far as divorce is concerned, sister, broadly, you can categorize divorce into five categories. <clears throat> five categories. One is by mutual consent of the husband and wife both. First category. Second category, unilaterally by the will of the husband. Third category, that if it is mentioned in the Nikanama, when a woman is marrying a man, if she mentions the contract, by default, the authority is given to the man in the Quran. Why? I'll come to it later on. But in the Nikanama, since marriage is a marital contract, a woman can put down any clause in marriage which is not prohibited in the Quran. She can even say that I do not want my husband to take a second wife because marrying more than one wife is not compulsory in Islam. If the boy agrees, he marries, otherwise they don't marry, she finds a new boy, new boy and he finds, a new, he finds a new girl. But she can put the clause that I do not want you to take a second wife as long as I am alive. But you cannot put a clause which is against the Quran. You can't put a clause saying, I don't want you to offer prayer. Because offering salah is compulsory. You can put a clause which is optional. Similarly, she can put a clause that I too want to give unilateral divorce. 
it's called as talaq e tawfid or isma third category fourth category is if she does not mention in the clause but yet she wants divorce she can request the husband i don't want you i don't want to stay with you she can request the husband to give divorce that's called as talaq and the fifth category if the husband does not agree and if the husband ill treats her she can go to the qazi she can go to the judge and she can take nikah e fask that means nullification of the marriage if the husband ill treats her does not give her a rights she can go to the judge and she can nullify the marriage so even a woman can take divorce but under normal circumstances the man has been given the authority why because in marriage the person who's the loser is the man not the woman the woman gains if you heard my talk last week on last saturday in the talk women's rights in islam subjugated or protected i mentioned that during marriage the woman is on the receiving side the quran says in surah nisa chapter 4 verse number 4 that give to the woman in marriage a marital gift mahr in marriage it is the husband who gives to the would be wife an amount a mahr and mahr can be any amount so imagine if and if before she is married it is the duty of the man duty of the father and the brother after she is married it is the duty of the husband and the son to look after lodging boarding clothing all financial aspect and if divorce takes place it is the duty of the parents to look after her if not the parents it is the duty of the society to look after her if not the society it is the duty of the islamic state to look after her. so she is financially secured if divorce takes place the man gives the divorce he loses the mahr but the woman she is on the receiving end now she has a chance to get married once she gets married she gets new mahr and the man when he has to marry another woman he has to give new mahr if the full authority is given to the woman the woman keeps on marrying and divorcing then she will keep on gaining money who is the loser is the man so almighty god even protects the man status other i have to give a talk on man's rights in islam because if a divorce takes place man is more of a loser than a woman financially and otherwise woman gets protection from the family from the society from the state man doesn't so because of that allah almighty god has secured the man but yet if the woman wants she can mention the marital contract she too can give divorce or she can request divorce from the husband called as kula or if the husband ill treats she can go to a judge and she can nullify the marriage which is called as nikah fask hope that answers the question yes thank you yes yeah. yes the sister in the, the sister in the rear mic come forward okay i am mrs paul i am an advocate in the high court i am a hindu married to a christian my question which has come to my mind is after hearing the uh, thoughts of doctor and the uh, teachings of islam regarding killing if killing is strictly prohibited in islam why don't the muslim spiritual leaders openly criticize and unitedly fight the killings going on in the name of jihad how can muslims allow islam to be misused and misquoted by a few of those muslims who are maligning the name of the entire community in the entire world sister last very good question <coughs> she said that she was impressed with the teaching of islam that islam is against killing innocent human being but how come all the muslim leaders don't get together and condemn the killing that is going on in the name of jihad and just because of few black sheep islam is being maligned sister for the detailed answer you should listen to my last talk in the last conference one year back in november 2008 my final speech of the second international peace conference was media and islam war of peace the main thing to blame it is the media it is the media who picks up black sheep of the community and they portray as though they are exemplary muslim it is the media So what you see in the media is not what's exactly happening. Quran clearly mentions in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number thirty-two, that if anyone kills any other human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed all, the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, it is as though he has saved the whole of humankind. 
So killing any innocent human being is a sin in Islam. Not only is it a sin, it is as though you have killed all of humanity. So anyone killing you find cases taking place where you are going, going on the street and a bomb blast takes place, etc. Killing innocent human being is totally prohibited. It's clear cut. And we do have, you know, when I, go, when I went to USA, I went to UK, we have Muslim organizations, you know, condemning. You know what bomb blast took place, you know, in the tube station in London, we condemn it. I went to America, I found some of the Muslim organizations condemning what's happening in 9-11. I agree with them. I agree with them. What happened in 9-11? A few thousand people killed. It is to be condemned. Who did it? I don't know. I'm not saying Muslim did it. It is the media which is saying there's no proof at all. There's no proof. But whoever did it? There are, if you go on the internet, you have various documentaries showing that it was a government job, inside job. George Bush did it. I don't know who did it. Whoever did it? Killing thousands of innocent human beings in 9-11 in the Twin Tower bombing is to be condemned. More than 50 people killed in the tube bombing in London is to be condemned. More than 100 people killed in Bombay in July, a couple of years back, in the train bombing in Bombay is to be condemned. But don't put a full stop. Simultaneously, I also condemn the thousands of people killed in Afghanistan, the thousands of people killed in Iraq, the thousands of people killed in Palestine. I call this white collar terrorism. You know what they are doing? They are giving missiles. They are sending bombs. You know, there in Palestine, they are fighting with stones. And they are called as terrorists. You know, the America is sending bombers, Patriot missiles. They are sending cluster bombs. Cluster bomb means it falls, it breaks up into many bombs and kills thousands of Afghanis. For what? It is a coward act. Therefore, I said in my last lecture, the biggest terrorist in the past couple of decades, it is George Bush. Number one. There is no one who has killed as many people as George Bush has killed. And now he's no longer there. In Iraq, he has put a sanction on medicine and Half a million children were killed in Iraq because of George Bush. We know very well, even if I agree that one person was hiding there, there is no proof that Bin Laden did it. Even if he did it, imagine for one man, you are killing thousands of people. It is, it is absurd. What we find, it is the media which is portraying. Media which is portraying that Muslims are doing this. I do know there are black sheep sisters. There are black sheep in the community. There are black sheep in every community. Indian media talks about Kashmir. How often do they talk about Assam? Next the light. The Maoist. You know the biggest threat to India are the Maoist. What are they doing? They are bombarding the police station. They are killing the police. The maximum killing that has been done in India by the Maoist, by the communist, the LTT, Hindus. Who calls them Hindu terrorists? You go to Assam, the Christian terrorist. If when when the Hindus do it, you call it L-T-T-E, Liberation Tamil Tigers, Elam. In, if you go to UK, <coughs> IRA, Irish Republican Army, they are Catholics. They have a big difference between the Catholics and the Protestants. No one calls them Catholic terrorists. Why? So what we find, that no religion teaches to kill innocent human beings. But there are more non-Muslims killing innocent human beings than Muslims. Now so-called Muslims who killed innocent human beings, they aren't Muslims. They aren't following the teachings of the Quran and the Prophet. But what the media does, media picks up these black sheep and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. So the media is to blame number one. Media. The media can change black into white, day into night, hero into villain, villain into a hero. You can hear my talk. Is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? And you'll get more details, inshallah. Thank you. Yes, brother. Good evening, sir. My name is Rahul Gonkar, and I'm just a student. I just need to ask you, in the Islamic religion, why the Shias Muslim people are given less importance compared to other Muslims? It means I have, to, I have also heard one of my Muslim friends that they are not even allowed to drink water from a Shia family. Not even a water, okay? 
means uh, I just need to ask means uh, it is also said that means in Iraq there was a Sandab, Saddam Hussein has done so many cruelism on Shias people there he has sent, uh, means the chemical he has spread a chemical gas he has done a cruelism on Shias people as compared to Hitler has done on Jewish people in the second world war so don't you think it's an injustice and I also I, I also need to know that means what exactly the Shias people has done a mistake in the Islamic religion before so means still down still that stuff is suffering right now these days the brother asked the question that why are Shias considered inferior and what mistake they have done why Saddam Hussein killed them like Hitler has killed Germany with chemical weapons etc so the in Islam there is no Shia Sunni there is no Shia Sunni in Islam I'll give the answer I'll give the answer I'll give the answer and then you're most welcome. In Islam, there is no Shia Sunni. What Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 103, Wa tasimu bi hablillahi jamiya wala tafarraku. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. We have to hold to the rope of Allah, the Quran, and the teaching of the Prophet, the Sai Hadith. If you hold to them, then you are a true Muslim. There is no Shia Sunni in Islam. And there is no sect in Islam. The Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 159, O Prophet, Anyone who makes division, who makes sex in the religion of Islam, you have nothing to do with him. Allah will look after the affairs on the day of judgment. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that there will be 73 sects in Islam. Out of that, only one will go to Jannah. The Sahabas asked, which one? Those who follow me and my Sahabas. Those who follow Quran and the authentic teachings of the Prophet. So, the Quran says, don't make sex. A prophet said, even though the Quran says, there will be some people who will make sex. How many? 73. The one who will be on the true path is one who doesn't make sex. So anyone who calls himself anything besides Muslims, the word is Muslim. Muslim means a person who submits will to God. What was the prophet? Was he Shia? Was he Sunni? What was he? He was Muslim. And the answer I gave to the earlier sister of Sulay al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, it says, فَقُلُوا شَدُوا بِيَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ We bear witness that we are Muslim. If you want to judge whether the Muslim is right or wrong, what do you do? You check with the Quran. Let him call himself Muhammad, Zakir, Sultan, Abdullah, no problem. You check it up if he's following the Quran and the authentic teachings of the Prophet. Bukhari, Muslim, authentic teaching, he's a true Muslim. If he goes against the two teachings of the Prophet, the Sai Hadith of Bukhari, Muslim and all the other Sai Hadith, and goes against the Quran, he is not a true Muslim. A true Muslim is a person who follows the Quran and the authentic teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when you come to know, let him call himself anything. If he does not follow the Quran and does not follow the authentic teaching of the Prophet, he is not a true Muslim. <laughs> Regarding the second part of the question, Saddam that. Hussein. Saddam Hussein is not in the question. It is in the question, no? Ah. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein killed Shias. <laughs> I don't know whether he killed Shias or not. The media says. But, whether it be Saddam Hussein, whether it be Hitler, whether it be George Bush, anyone kills any innocent human being. Leave us at Shia Sunni. Even if he kills the innocent Hindu, innocent Christian, innocent Jew. He, it, 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 George Bush, right. Hitler, Sultan. I believe in this Shias, Sunnis, or Bori Muslims, sir. I am not saying that. Quran, there is no Shia Sunni in the Quran. Means there is no there are so many the Quran. There, so, so many That's you tell them. You ask them, where is the word Shia mentioned in the Quran? Ask him, where is Bori mentioned in the Quran? Sir, it is a, it's a, my college is there in Bandra, sir. I am studying. So the these people are uh -huh. not following. If what you have to do, ask them. Are they following the teachings of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Are they following the teachings of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 159. Anyone who makes sex, division in Islam, you have nothing to do with him. Anyone who divides the religion of Islam, it is prohibited. So if you have to be a good Muslim, you have to hold to the rope of Allah, that is the Quran. So just by calling someone Abdullah, Sultan, whatever it is, will not take you to Jannah, but following the teachings of the Creator Almighty God and following the teachings of Prophet Muhammad peace. Brother, I would like to ask you a question. I have no question. There was so much bother about Shia Sunni. Uh -huh. I want to ask you why. 
So there are so many my friends no, are no. there. Do you want to do you want to join Islam and then you're thinking what to take? So I'm Sir, asking you the question. Yeah. Sir, do you want to come to Islam and uh -huh. you're thinking should you join Shia or Sunni? Sir, no, I'm. No. No, there are so many, sir. There are so many religions are there. I mean, in Islam, there are so many sections of religion. There is no there. section in Islam. Uh -huh. Islam, there is only one Muslim. Whoever told you, whoever told you, uh -huh. did not tell you what Quran says. I am giving you reference. So the person is told me she, he was a Sunni. He told me that. Let him be Sunni. Let him be Shia. Let him be Bori. Anyone. Uh -huh. Tell him Quran says don't make sex. Chapter number six. Write it down. It means this Chapter is all absurd. So it means this is all absurd. He is not following Quran. Quran says Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 150. Note it down. The Dr. Zakir Naik said Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 159. That don't make sex. What you have to do is you have to submit your will to God. Now I want to know brother, do you want to submit your will to God? Brother, uh -huh. do you want to submit your will to God? Sir, so I respect Islam, sir. So I believe in Islam. No, no. Fine. You respect Islam. Do you believe? Do you believe there is one God? Uh -huh. Do you believe there is one God? Yes, sir, I believe in God. Do you believe idol worship is wrong? Uh huh. Do you believe that God has got no idols? God has no idol. Do you believe that? I don't know, sir. Do you believe in idol worship? Uh huh. Do you believe in idol worship? Yeah. Idol worship is right or wrong? Means to God. No. Do you believe that worshipping an idol is right or wrong? Yes. It is right or is it wrong? It's right, sir. Doing idol worship. But that's against your Vedas. Your Veda says you should not worship anyone but one God. Uh -huh. Quran is mentioned in your Yajur Ved, chapter 32, verse number 3. Sveta says the Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19. Pratima Asti. Of that God, there is no Pratima, there is no image, there is no photograph, there is no painting, there is no idol, there is no sculpture, there is no statue. I am asking you a question. When your Veda says God has got no image, no statue, no idol, do you yet believe in idol worship? Yes, so sir. leave us at Shia Sunni, I am asking you, are you following your Veda? Yes, sir. Are you following or not? Yes, sir. Are you following? Sir, because I am from that religion, sir. Correct. So, so I am talking about... It is not my mistake, sir. I am born in that religion, sir. It is, if you are brought up in that religion, uh -huh. I am asking you, isn't your duty to study? Your That's Veda... I am on this subject. Therefore, I am asking you, brother, uh -huh. that in your scripture Veda, uh -huh. Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, Sveta Sveta Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19. It says, Na Tasya Patima Asti. It's a Sanskrit quotation, which means, Almighty God has got no Pratima, no image, no photograph, no painting, no sculpture, no idol, no statue. If your scripture says, Almighty God has got no idol, then doing idol worship is right or wrong? Right or wrong? Sir, I don't even know that, sir, because I'm not... Such a big person to decide this that it's a right or wrong. No, but if your scripture is saying God has got no image, no photograph, no idol, no statue, then making a statue of God is right or wrong? So my my previous person means my Purvaj has done this, sir. So I cannot blame on them, sir. Sorry? My Purvaj, my previous the the Hinduism people has done this, so I cannot blame on those I'm because not I, I don't need people. the truth. I am asking you the question, uh -huh. your scripture, which is the most authentic scripture in your religion? You don't know. Do what, you know? Sir? Which is the highest scripture in your religion? So, it Adi is Vedas. Yeah, Vedas. Therefore, you see my video cassette, similarities between Islam and Hinduism, and I request one of the volunteers to give him my DVD, similarities with Islam and Hinduism. Watch the DVD. If you have queries, you can meet me, and, and inshallah, I'll clarify your doubt. And then I would request you, read that, understand and find the two piece. Sir, and the last thing I just need to ask you that it means we have to not believe in this, that there are so many sections of Islam, that Sunni, Shia, we should, not believe, we should only believe in Quran, right? Quran and the authentic sayings of Prophet, that's it. Any scholar says anything. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 159, Atiullah, Atiur Rasul, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And continues, and those who have been given the authority for command, those who have charged with affairs, with affairs, that means you have to follow Allah, Almighty God, His messengers, and those who are knowledgeable. But the world does not stop there. It says if they differ, if the people of knowledge differ, go back to Allah and His Rasul. If someone tells you something, you verify from the Quran and the authentic Hadith whether it's right or wrong. 
just because any scholar says anything, it carries no weight in Islam. So that Our thing is Allah, Almighty God, and the Messenger. If oh. any scholar says something, if it matches with Quran and Sahih Hadith, you accept it. If it is against Quran and Hadith, you reject it. So just by a person saying he's a Muslim, you have to tell him, Pull hatu bunanakum, produce your proof, in kundum sadiqin, but if you're truthful. That's the reason. Whenever I give an answer, I give you references from the Quran and Sahih Hadith. What I'm saying, what Dr. Zakir Naik says, is zero in Islam. It carries no value. What I say in Islam is zero. Nil. What Quran says, what Almighty God says, what our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, that carries weight. So what I'm giving, I'm giving references. Person who does not know, I'm giving references. My answer is based on this teaching of the Quran, these verses. My answer is based on this teaching of the Prophet, Sai Bukhari, Wam number so and so, etc., to give proof. So what they say carries weight, what I say carries no weight. Hope that answers the question. Okay, yes, brother, the second, the question from the middle mic. Mic two. <clears throat> good evening, everyone, and good evening, Dr. Nayak. Today, I am a human speaking on behalf of humanity. Now, Dr. Nayak, since you Does were... Have your name? Yeah, name I am Chirag, and please don't ask my religion. Dr. Nayak, since you were born, maybe in a Muslim family, you were prescribed with your religion. Now, that is why today you are endorsing it maybe. If you would have been born in a Hindu family, it could have been possible that today this religion would have been on Hinduism. This, I feel, is an extreme case of ethnocentrism, wherein you feel your religion, culture, beliefs and ideas are supreme. That is why you said that Sikhism or Arya Samaj or whatever religion that abandons idol worship is supported by you too. According to me, we should be discussing a larger religion of humanity and not keep juggling here. Any comments or justification, sir? Very good question. He says that because I was born in a Muslim family, that's the reason I'm endorsing Islam. Maybe if I was born in a Hindu family, I would be endorsing Hinduism. And I'm supporting Arya Samaj and Sikhism because it matches my view and I'm juggling around. I should rather speak about broader aspect. Very good question. Yes. Brother, I agree with you. Till the age of 19, I was a Muslim only because my father was a Muslim. After the age of 19, when I started studying about comparative religion, now I'm a Muslim by choice. And believe me, if you can point out any other religion to me better than Islam, I am ready to accept that religion today. Today. Sir, I am endorsing the religion of humanity. Brother, I'll come to it. Yeah. I'll come to it. Yeah. I'm telling anyone, prove to me logically, scientifically, any other religion better than Islam, I am ready to accept it. You are telling, you are talking about humanity. Who wrote this religion, humanity? Mahatma Gandhi? Who wrote it? You know, a Muslim cannot be a good Muslim unless he's a human being. That no. every religion says, every Brother. religion says... Brother, let me complete my answer. Yes, sir. Are you here to hear my answer or are you here to give your views? I would like to have a healthy discussion and reach Brother, to a logical conclusion. This is not a debate session. Not at all. I never said... So listen to my answer. After my answer, you can give your comment. Okay, please. Let me finish my answer. Keep on interjecting. That means, you listen to the answer, Carry on. listen carefully. Yeah. Something is going, Mahabharat is going in your mind, how will you listen? When Please you, carry on. When you read out your question, did I interrupt? Please carry on. Did I interrupt? You, you did not. Please okay. carry on. You written everything, writing down, coming, asking question. Now I I'm, said... I'm giving yeah. the reply, listen. This yeah, is my that's reply. what, I'm listening. So why are you commenting? Please carry on, sir. Please justify, tell me your answer. If you listen to my answer, you'll, you'll understand. Otherwise, all, all this, more than 100,000 people will understand, yet you'll have the same question. I'm a medical doctor. A person can't concentrate on two different things. Listen to the answer. After the answer is over, no problem. So what you have to realize, you are saying, 
You are talking about humanity. First you said, don't ask my religion. Then you are saying, I am endorsing humanity. First of all, you are ashamed to identify your view. Then you are talking about humanity. I am asking the question, who wrote this book called humanity? Is there any book? Is there any guidelines of humanity? I am telling you, a Muslim cannot be a Muslim until he is a good human being. Every religion doesn't say that. I am sorry to say that. You have not studied the other religion. I can give a talk. I can give you quotations from the Vedas, quotations from Hindu scriptures, quotations from the Bible, which goes against humanity. I am not here to criticize any religion. If you have not studied any religion, please don't say anything which you have no knowledge of. Quran says, Fas'alu ahal zikri in kuntum ta'alamun. Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 43, Surah Ambiya chapter 21 verse number 7. You are not a student of comparative religion. So please don't make comments without knowing. I can give you quotations from the Bible against humanity. I challenge you to point out a single verse of the Quran, a single teaching of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, which is against humanity. So don't tell me every religion says that. Sorry, your knowledge is very weak. What I'm trying to tell you, humanity means, okay, you're in standard two. I am talking about not only passing school, not only graduation, you have to become postgraduate. Islam means higher level. Only humanity is low level. No Muslim can be a good Muslim unless he is a good human. I challenge you to point out a single teaching of Islam which is against humanity. You may not be knowing the logical background, the logical reason why Islam has prescribed that teaching and you may think it is against humanity. I will say, oh, doctor is giving me injection, it is poking me. But that injection is good for you. No, doctor, doctor is cutting up my tummy. He is cutting up my tummy to save your life. So doctor knows, you don't know. So similarly, I challenge you to point out, so why should I, if I have two choices, okay, passing standard two or three, or doing post-graduation. I would prefer post-graduation. Why only standard two and three? Humanity is good. But Islam is far superior than that. Regarding your question, I am endorsing Islam because I was born in a Muslim family. I told you, I challenge you, if anyone proves to me any other religion, I have studied all the, most of the major religions, and I think Islam is the most logical the best religion for humanity, it is the only religion which has the solution for humanity. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in the Dina in the Layal Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is Islam. And for your information, your argument is so weak. Do you know, out of more than 30 scholars that we have from different parts of the world, more than 10, they were not born in a Muslim family. Do you know that? I'd like you to answer this question. Do you know that? I Out of 30 people speaking from the stage, more than 10, they were not born Muslim. Do you know that? Sir, I attached maybe. I'm asking That's you maybe. a question. Do you know that? No, yes I don't no? know that. So that means the whole argument falls down. Out of the 30 people speaking from different parts of the world, more than 10 are from America, 4 are from Canada, few are from UK, we are from Malaysia, we have a couple from Saudi Arabia, from UAE, from Somalia, from Sudan. And more than 10, they were born in non-Muslim families. They grew up. Some accepted Islam in the teenage, some accepted Islam in the 20s, some in 30s. And Allah gave them Hidayah. They are Muslims by choice. So your logic that because we are born in Muslim family, therefore I'm endorsing. These people weren't born in Muslim family. They were born in Christian family. They were born in non-Muslim family. Yet they're endorsing Islam. Why? Because... They have studied. They have studied other religions and they found Islam is the best way of life. What I request you, you study humanity and study Islam. And try and find out what point in Islam is against humanity. Then you'll come to know that the best religion, I'm not asking you religion, I'm asking you to accept the best religion. And the best way of life, the only solution for humanity is Islam. Thank you. Yes, sister. Mic number one. The uh, good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Kalpna. I want to ask my next question. Sorry, I think we missed out one. Any, any question on there? 
the volunteer can they reply there is a question huh? okay uh, sister if you can just hold on a minute yes we can have the question on the mic yeah sure last mic in the gender good evening sir my name okay. yes brother your name and your question yeah uh, hello dr jack nayak my name is mahind kumar and i am by qualification mba and work for thomas cook at fort my question is regarding non vegetarian foods it is allowed in islam animals are living beings so don't you think that it is uh, uh, violence and my second question is that is it compulsory in islam to have non veg food and can a pure vegetarian person can follow islam mr mahesh kumar has asked a very good question he said that in islam you all have non veg food you all kill animals why does islam give permission to kill living creatures and can a muslim be a pure vegetarian brother before i answer the question i like to tell you a muslim can be a very good muslim even by being a pure vegetarian it is not compulsory in islam that you should have non veg food it is not compulsory but since allah says in the quran and gives permission for a person to have non veg food in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 1 it says that eat of the four footed animals which have been made lawful for you it's mentioned in surah nahl chapter 16 verse number 5 that you can eat the meat of the cattle it's mentioned in surah mu'minun chapter 23 verse number 21 that in the cattle we give you a drink which is good for the human kind and of the meat you can eat so when almighty god gives you permission to eat the meat of the lawful animals then why should we not have now coming to the logical reason why islam permits you to have non veg food if you analyze in non veg food it's rich in protein the human body it requires 23 amino acids out of which eight are not made in the human body it should be given by external diets which are known as essential amino acids now these all eight essential amino acids are present in no kind of vegetable food together it's only present in flesh food so the non veg flesh food is more nutritious as compared to vegetables furthermore if we analyze if you see the set of teeth of the herbivorous animal the cow the goat the sheep they have got flat set of teeth they only have vegetables they don't have flesh food if we analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animal the tiger the leopard the lion they have got months if you give them bacon for 6 months if you give them birds for 7 months 
If you give them deer for eight months, and the menu continues, big menu is there. It says if you give buffalo for 11 months, if you give the flesh of cow, our ancestors will be satisfied for one full year. And if you give red meat of goat or meat of rhinoceros, they will be satisfied inexhaustibly. So according to Hindu scriptures, eating non veg is not a sin. It is because many of the Hindus were being influenced by the Ahimsa philosophy of not killing any living creature. They started accepting it. But even this philosophy of Ahimsa, as you said, that killing living creature is a sin. Brother, do you know that even plants, plants have got life? Do you know that, brother? So if you say killing living creatures is a sin, killing a plant is also a sin. So why do you have plants? Agree. Agree. Very good. Furthermore, there are some people who say, okay, okay, brother Zakir, I agree that plants have got life, but the plants can't feel pain. Therefore, killing a plant is a lesser sin as compared to killing animal. The point to be noted is that even today science has advanced and we have come to know even the plants can feel pain. But the cry of the plant cannot be heard by the human being because human beings hear the frequency that they hear is from 20 cycles per second to 20,000 cycles per second. Anything below and above this range you cannot hear. So there's a farmer in America who converted the cry of the plant into the human frequency and you could come to know when the plants were crying, when they wanted water. There's another person who came and argued with me and told me, Brother Zakir, I agree with you that plants have got life, plants can feel pain, but the plants have got about two senses less as compared to the animals. Therefore, killing a plant is a lesser sin as compared to killing an animal. I'm asking you the question, brother. Suppose your brother, your elder brother, he is born deaf and dumb. After he grows up, and someone comes and kills him. So will you go and tell the judge, me Lord, give the murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses less. He could not hear, he could not speak. Will you say that? In fact, you will say, give the murderer double punishment. He could not hear, he could not speak. My brother was masoom, he was innocent. So in Islam it does not work like that, two senses or three senses. The Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 168, eat of the good things they have provided to you. As long as the food is halal, it's tayyab for you, you can have it. And furthermore, I personally have got no problem if the non-Muslim don't have non-veg. I've got no problem. Only if they tell me eating non-veg is a sin, it's a crime, that's the time I give the reply. Otherwise, if the non-Muslims in, in India, they don't have non-veg, it's beneficial for me. If all the non-Muslims in India start having non-veg, then the prices of mutton and beef will rise. It'll be more expensive for me to have it. So personally, I've got no problem. Hope that satisfies the answer, brother. Yeah, definitely, sir. So now, if you want, you can yet be a good vegetarian. If you want, you can eat non-veg also. Eating non-veg will keep you more healthy. You can have, but even if you want to be a pure vegetarian, it's not a sin. Hope that answers the question, brother. Yes, sister, your question. Can I have a mic? Bolo, my one, sister. Yeah. So I'm Dr. Kalpna. My question is, does Islam support marrying in relationships? As you know, in medicine, there are a lot of birth abnormalities due to consanguous marriages. That is, in relations marrying. Please explain. The sister asked the question, does Islam permit consanguineous marriages? Marrying close relatives. Yes. As far as marriages are concerned, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 20 to 25, that you cannot, those marriages which are prohibited, that you cannot marry your mother, your daughter, the sister of your mother, the sister of your father, and a list is given of the close of the close madam. But marrying first cousin is permitted. But brother, sister, father, mother, this is not permitted. But first cousin is permitted. Today science tells us that directly if you marry, the blood brother and sisters marry, there are high chances of abnormalities. They can be genetic problems. So directly brother and sister marry, father and daughter, mother and son, 
if they marry or direct paternal uncle, first uncle, sister of the father, etc., there are high chances of abnormality. So Islam prohibits this. But as far as first cousins is concerned, Islam permits it. And today science tells us that even in first cousin, the chances is there, but it is negligible. Genetic problem can even come if you marry, if two people, boy and girl, even if they are unknown, if they marry, there is no problem. Even if they are not relatives, yet there can be a genetic problem in them. That doesn't mean that genetic problem only comes in relatives. Yes, it comes, the chances are very high if they are direct blood brothers and sisters, mother and father, direct uncle. But first cousin, the chances are a little bit more as compared to unknown, but the difference is forbidden. Therefore, the hadith, according to Dr. Ahmad Sakhar, the hadith in which the Prophet said that do not marry continuously generation after generation amongst your first cousin. So generation after generation we keep on marry, then there is a problem. Otherwise, even medical science says generally it's no problem, but generation after generation, if you keep on doing this, first cousin marries again, first cousin again, first cousin, then the chances rise a bit. Otherwise, normally there's no problem at all. Hope that answers the question, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, this. The sister and the rare. Mic number two, sister, sir. Assalamu alaikum. I've got two questions to ask. The first one is that, why can't a Muslim girl get married to a non-Muslim guy and still follow Islam? And I've got one more question. As it is acceptable in Islam for a man that he can marry four times, do we have to inform the first wife about the second marriage or he can be like he can marry without informing the first wife? Sister, the two questions she has asked. The first question is that the first question she posed is that in Islam in Islam is it compulsory that you should take the permission of the first wife before marrying the second wife? And the first question of hers was that in uh, Islam, why can a man marry a non-Muslim girl? As far as the first question it is... Like that. I'm sorry. It's like, why can... A, if a girl is born in a Muslim family, why she cannot marry a non-Muslim guy and still follow Islam? Why can't a girl who's married in a Muslim... who's born in a Muslim family marry a non-Muslim man and yet follow Islam? The reason is because it goes against the teaching of our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 221, that do not marry a mushrika, do not marry a mushrik until he believes. Do not marry an idol worshipper. Do not marry a non-believer until he believes. Even a believer, even if he's a slave man, even if he's a bondsman, he's far better than a non-believer, than a mushrik man. Then a non-Muslim man, even if he allows you, means even if he may be the most handsome man in the world, he may be the richest man. And if he's a non-Muslim, a Muslim man who may be dark, who may be ugly, who may be a slave, is far superior. Similarly, the verse continues that for a man, he should not marry an unbelieving woman until she believes. A believing woman who is a slave woman is far superior than an unbelieving woman even if she allows you. The logical reason, sister, is that in a car or in a vehicle, if one tire is of a bicycle and the other tire is of a truck, so will the vehicle run? But naturally, no. All the four tires should be equal. And furthermore, you ask the question that how can, can she be a good Muslim by marrying a non-Muslim? The reason is that in Islam, we want our spouse our life partner also to go to Jannah. Now she has found the way to Jannah. She has found the way to paradise. That her paradise is in following Islam. She should follow the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Now imagine when she knows that she is going to go to paradise and a husband who is doing idol worship, who doesn't believe in Islam, who is going to go to hell. This life, sister, is a small portion as compared to next life. This life, maybe you stay with the husband for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, how long? 60 years. The next life is eternal life. That means she's selfish. A good Muslim or a good Muslimah. A good Muslim man or woman would also want that their spouse, the husband or wife, should also go to Jannah. 
So that is the reason it's important that both the husband and wife are Muslims. As far as the second question is concerned, is it compulsory for the Muslim man to take the permission of the first wife before he marries the second wife? It is not compulsory unless it is mentioned in the Nikanama. If it is mentioned in the Nikanama, in the marital contract, if the wife has said you should not take a second wife as long as I live, then it becomes compulsory. If it's not mentioned in the Nikanama, it is not compulsory. But at least he should inform her. Why? Only if he inform the one of the criteria to marry more than one wife, as the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number three is marry woman of a choice in twos, threes, or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. So one of the criteria to marry more than one wife is you should be just between your wives. So if you do not inform your wife, how will you do justice between your wife? Maybe you'll tell life that I'm going for office work, I'm going out of Bombay, you may not go. So therefore, if you marry a second wife, taking permission is not a must, it's not compulsory, but at least inform her so that you can do justice between both your wives. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. Yes, brother, mic one. Assalamualaikum, uh, Zakir Bhai. I have been introduced to you by my sir, uh, Nasir Sir Guru, who is a teacher by profession. And uh, the first time I heard you was at uh, Azad Maidan and uh, the topic was uh, similarities between Hinduism and Islam. My name is Dipen Seth and I am working with a construction company. I have come across an argument by my fellow friends when we have discussed about uh, these topics. And uh, the question is that when the Mughals were there, they have tempered with the Hindu scriptures and that's the reason we find, uh, you know, the, some references and things like that in the scriptures. Is it a myth or a reality? Please throw some light on it. Thank you. Brother, that's a very good question that when the Mughals came to India, they tampered with the Hindu scriptures. Is it a myth or is it a reality? The, as far as my study goes, it is a myth. There are some things what the Hindus said did come into the scripture, for example, the word Hindu. The word Hindu doesn't exist in any of the Hindu scriptures before the Arabs came to India. Hindu is actually a geographical definition. The word Hindu was first used by the Arabs. When they came to India, they said Hindi, Hindi. Even now today when I go to Saudi, they call me Hindi. Hindi I I am a Hindi. Hindi means it's a geographical definition for people living in the land of the Indus Valley. It's not a religious definition. That's the reason Jawaharlal Nehru says the word Hindu does not appear in the Hindu scriptures until the Arabs came to India. But regarding a question, the Mughals tampered with the Hindu scriptures. Point number one. As far as my study goes, the Mughals did not tamper with Hindu scriptures. Fine. Now, even if I agree with you, that the Mughal is tempered. Now, once they are tempered, you leave that scripture now. If you agree that the scripture is tempered, so leave it now. What are you going to follow? A tempered scripture? Follow a scripture which is not tempered. Quran. So, even if I agree with your argument that Mughals have tempered the scripture, now leave that scripture. Suppose you have a glass, two glasses of water. One glass is pure. In the other glass, someone puts one drop of one drop of gutter water. It's in front of you. But once it mixes, you can't make out the dirt. Will you have the glass of water? No. Why? You can't see it. But because you saw dirty black color drop, it falls in the glass of water, it mixes, you can't make out. Will you have it? Will you have the glass of water? Once I've seen it, I won't have Correct. it. Correct. Very good. Because you're logical. So even if I agree with you that Mughals have tempered their scripture, leave their scripture. Have the pure scripture. Quran. And if you say they have not tempered, your, the Hindu scripture says you have to follow the Quran. Hindu scripture says that you have to follow Prophet Muhammad peace be. If they have not tempered, if they have tempered, leave it, follow this. If they have tempered, the scripture says that you have to believe in one God, which I give quotation. Besides giving quotation of God, that scripture also says that you have to follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I can give you quotations from the Hindu scriptures talking about the coming of Muhammad 
इफ यू रीड द हिंदू स्क्रिप्चर भविष्य पुराना पर्व थ्री खंड थ्री अध्यय थ्री श्लोका फाइव टू एट इट टॉक्स अबाउट मोहम्मद सल्लाम भविष्य पुराना पर्व थ्री खंड थ्री अध्यय थ्री श्लोका टेन टू ट्वेंटी सेवन टॉक अबाउट मोहम्मद सल्लाम इफ यू रीड द कुंटअप सुक्ता अथर्वा वेद बुक नंबर ट्वेंटी हिम नंबर वन ट्वेंटी सेवन वर्स नंबर वन टू फोर्टीन टॉक अबाउट मोहम्मद सल्लाम इफ यू रीड अथर्वा वेद बुक नंबर ट्वेंटी हिम नंबर ट्वेंटी वन वर्स नंबर सिक्स अथर्वा वेद बुक नंबर ट्वेंटी हिम नंबर ट्वेंटी वन वर्स नंबर सेवन टॉक नंबर मोहम्मद सल्लाम रिग वेद बुक नंबर वन हिम नंबर फिफ्टी नाइन वर्स नंबर सिक्स हिम नंबर फिफ्टी थ्री वर्स नंबर नाइन इट टॉक्स अबाउट मोहम्मद सल्लाम इफ यू रीड द साम वेद अग्नि मंत्र नंबर सिक्सटी फोर टॉक्स अबाउट मोहम्मद सल्लाम इवन मोहम्मद सल्लाम इज मैंशन बाई नेम ही इज कॉल्ड एज अहमद द वन हु प्रेज इज इन साम वेद उत्तर चिक मंत्र नंबर 1500 इन इन सामवेद इंद्रा चैप्टर नंबर टू मंत्र नंबर 152 फिफ्टी टू इन यजुर्वेद चैप्टर नंबर थर्टी वन वर्स नंबर एट इन ऋग्वेद बुक नंबर एट हिम नंबर सिक्स मंत्र नंबर टेन इन अथर्वा वेद बुक नंबर एट हिम नंबर फाइव मंत्र नंबर सिक्सटीन अथर्वा वेद बुक नंबर ट्वेंटी हिम नंबर वन ट्वेंटी फोर मंत्र नंबर फोर्टीन ही इज इवन मैंशन बाय नेम एज मोहम्मद ही इज कॉल्ड एज नारा शंसा नारा शंसा मीन्स नर मीन्स मैन Shansa means prashansa, praise. One who is worth praising, the praiseworthy. If you translate Nara Shansa into Arabic, it becomes Muhammad. He is mentioned by name Muhammad as Nara Shansa in several places. Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number thirteen, verse number three. Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number eighteen, mantra number nine. Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number hundred and six, mantra number four. Uh, Rig Ved. Book number one, hymn number one forty two, mantra number three. Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number three, mantra number two. Rig Ved, book number five, hymn number two, mantra number two. Rig Ved, book number seven, hymn number two, mantra number two. Rig Ved, book number ten, hymn number one hundred and eighty four, mantra number three. Yajur Ved, chapter number twenty one, verse number thirty seven. Yajur Ved, chapter number twenty one, verse number thirty one. Yajur Ved, chapter number twenty one, verse number fifty one. Yajur Ved, chapter number twenty, verse number thirty seven. Yajur Ved, chapter number twenty, verse number fifty seven. Yajur Ved, chapter number twenty eight, verse number two. Yajur Ved, chapter number twenty eight, verse number nineteen. Yajur Ved, chapter number twenty eight, verse number forty two. I can keep on quoting only references of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned in the scriptures. So your scriptures say that prophet that there is one God, you worship him alone. And you have to follow the last and final messenger. Even when the scriptures speak about the Kalki Avatar, about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the last and final messenger, it says his mother's name will be Sumati. That's Amina, the name of our Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mother. It says his father's name will be Vishnu Yas, servant of God, Abdullah, which is the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam father. It says he will be born in Sambala, a place of peace. That is Makka. He'll be born in the place in the family of the chief of Makka, and we know in the family of Quraysh. He'll have four companions. Talking of the Sahaba, I can go on and on and on talking about this Kalki Avatar. He will come. He'll be the last messenger. That is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. I am asking you, brother, do you believe in one God? Yeah. Do you believe that there is no idol worship? Yeah, I don't believe in idol worship. After I heard uh, your speech at Agra Maidan, so you know I'm very clear in all those aspects, and I've heard you a lot of times. So I just had a question which was posed to me, and I wanted an answer for that. So wanted to hear that. So. Do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger? Yeah, I do believe in La Ilaha Illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Mashallah. So, yeah. <laughs> Mashallah. So my concept is very clear, and uh, I thank Allah you. you thank you from the bottom of my heart that you doing such a good work, and you're clearing all these misconceptions that we all people do have. Mashallah. Reward you, brother. And in Islam, in Islamic world, if you submit your will, a person is called as a Muslim. Exactly, yes, so when, exactly, sir. Sorry to interrupt you, but that's the reason when people ask me who, uh, who what's your religion, and uh, you know, I speak Gujarati, and when they tell me what's your religion, I just uh, when I heard you. That uh, you know the definition of a Muslim is the person who will bows his will to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and that's what I told him that you know I'm a Muslim. So he was like shocked. So the Allah reason why he was shocked is that I, I speak Gujarati. I know where uh, you know I'm a Muslim or something, or you know come from a Muslim background family. So I was like I'm born in whichever family it is, but then I know what is right, and I've just studied that, and that's what I. Talk about and I preach about and I just try to do my bit in the small pieces and bits that I can do. So thank, thank you, you sir. Really thank you, sir. And I thank you and may Almighty God grant you Jannah. And if you require any query, any question, the most welcome to contact us. It's a pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. May we have the next question from the mic in the center, the joint section. We have time only for uh, uh, one or two more questions, or seven minutes. 
before we Assalamu alaikum sir my name is Ajay Vaishnav I am working in your catering in VIP VIP lounge my question is from my family that everyone in all the books it's written that gods are same and god is one when i say you salam alaikum you can say me that hari om or oh hari om shanti salam alaikum means that maybe peace on you and om shanti means that maybe peace on you then why can't you say that that om shanti mera last the question that we say salam alaikum means peace be on you om shanti also means peace be on you shanti is no problem om is a problem what is the problem sir the om om people the hindus think that that is god om shanti no problem if i translate assalam alaikum ko aap pe shanti ho no problem shanti is no problem peace is no problem salam is no problem the problem is om what we have to realize that if we want we say may peace be on you we are requesting allah for that om is another concept which people have a different concept about om so if you say may god's peace be on you no problem but the moment you say om people may start having a negative picture or oh, is it about hinduism is it about a god something maybe having idol so because to divert not to divert it's better to be clear So only saying shanti is no problem in arabic we say assalamu alaikum may peace be on you in english or aap pe shanti ho the moment you add that shanti somebody else will give you besides creator then there's a problem so i hope peace is on you brother yes sir thank i you hope that you live in peace sir yes sir thank you brother hi from the brother in the rear quick question quick answers inshallah yes. namaste my question is this yes my name is jp kharge my question is short relating to the earlier question pertaining to the non veg food what are the effects on the mind of the human being brother asking the question what are the effects on the minds of a human being by having non veg food yes and there are various research is done and some people come and tell me as a scientifically it's healthy effect on the body good muscles good body healthy can be longer many you can see my debate on is non veg food permitted or prohibited for a for a human being as far as the question i i think you may be trying to hint that there is a research which says that what food you have has an effect on your behavior so if you eat animals then you start behaving like animals is it what you mean no 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 i am asking what are the effects on the thinking of the human being that's what i'm trying to tell you yes. that there's one research which says that if you eat food, animals you start behaving like animals means the effect is of animals there is a research which says what you eat has an effect on your behavior so that the reason we muslims we are allowed to eat only peace loving animals like cow goat sheep because we are peace loving human beings we are not permitted to have the ferocious animal like tiger lion leopard because we don't want to be violent so even if i agree with this research i would like to say that muslims are peace loving as far as health is concerned it is very healthy if a person has some medical problem having certain non veg food is problematic like that even veg food is problematic the food the food that causes maximum death in the world it is alcohol is alcohol veg or non veg brother alcohol is veg or non veg yes veg pardon alcohol is veg or non veg i am preparing vegetarian food alcohol is veg or non veg brother alcohol is vegetarian or non vegetarian food veg veg food the maximum death in the world by any food it is by vegetarian food alcohol number 2 death maximum is because of smoking smoking tobacco veg or non veg that is the non veg tobacco is veg or non veg cabbage cabbage is cabbage is veg not cabbage tobacco 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 is the non veg tobacco is non veg you get to man veg this is the vegetable vegetarian correct 
So maximum death that take place in the world is because of alcohol number one, vegetarian. Tobacco number two, vegetarian. So there's more problem in vegetarian food in the world than non-veg food. If you have certain problem medical, there may be certain non-veg food which will be helpful, but more harm in the world is because of vegetarian food. So what is harmful? Quran says banned. Quran doesn't ban all vegetables. Quran bans alcohol. Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 90. And even smoking. Surah Bakra chapter 2 verse 195. Because it is slow poisoning. So whatever is wrong should be banned. I, Quran does not ban all vegetables. For more details refer to my video cassette. Is, is non-veg food permitted or prohibited for a human being? Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Brothers and sisters are requested to please hold on. We are also going to have a dua after the next question is handled by Dr. Zakir. Yes, sister. Please hold on patiently for a few minutes more. Yes, sister. No non-Muslim sisters at this microphone. Uh, any sister at the red microphone? Brother, we don't, we don't have any non-Muslim sisters at this microphone. You had a my name is Kailash. I am an atheist. My question is, why do Muslims believe that Jesus is born without any biological father when there is a Quran uh, says that Allah says that he is the originator of a heaven and earth, how come he can have a son without any consort? We ask the question that Muslims believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born without any biological father. But the Quran says, how shall, he, how shall Almighty God have a son when he doesn't have a concert, he doesn't have a wife? That's the Quran says. So these are normal things the Quran says. As far as the miracle of Isa alayhi salam, Quran says in Sulay al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 47, when Maryam alayhi salam says, Mother Mary, that how shall I have a son when no man, no man has touched me? The reply come back, Angel Gabriel, Amran, kun When Allah decrees a matter, He just said to it, be and it is. Similarly, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 59, Allah says, Inna masala isa in the like masala adam. Khalaqa min turab, summa kala lo kun fayakun. The similitude of Jesus in front of Allah is like Adam. That He was created from dust and said be and it was. So what we realize that Almighty God normally by nature human beings are born by mother and father. But to show the power of Allah that he can create even without a mother, even without a father, the example is Isa alayhi salam. Another miracle Allah did, created a human being without mother or father that is Adam peace be upon him. But the verse of the Quran saying that Almighty God doesn't have a son. Neither does he have a concert, it means neither does he have a wife. And furthermore, Quran also says that if Allah begot a son, say, I would be the first person to bow down to him. That doesn't mean Allah has a son. It's saying that there's no question of Allah begetting because begetting is an animal act. It is function of lower animals of sex. That's the reason Allah will not beget. Allah does not require a wife also. Wife is required by us human beings. Mating is the function of no animal of sex. So these <coughs> verses of the Quran, that if Allah has a son, I would be the first to born, is negating that Allah can never have a son. Neither does Allah require a wife. So these are concepts of the Quran trying to say, don't belittle Allah by saying, Almighty God has a wife or has a son. It is not the dignity of Allah who is so gracious to have a son or to have a wife.